Wednesday, March 1st, 2023. The Minnesota Senate Agriculture, Broadband, and Rural Development Committee is now in session. Folks, we've got a really ambitious day today, uh, both in terms of uh, the sort of complexity uh, of some of the stuff we're talking about and then the sheer amount of stuff we're going to talk about. But luckily, the first thing we get to do uh, is hear from our friends in the Minnesota Pork Producers Association. It is Pork Day at the Capitol. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Anderson, if you could, please, would you come to the front of the room, introduce yourself, first and last name, and commence your testimony when you get a chance. Good afternoon, Chairman Putman, committee members. Uh, my name is John Anderson. I farm with my family near Belgrade, Minnesota, which is about 100 miles northwest of here. Thank you for having me today. I am a board member of the Minnesota Pork Producers Association. I'm the immediate uh, past president. Uh, Minnesota Pork Producers Association is a farmer-led organization that represents Minnesota's more than 3,000 family pig farms. Today I would like to provide you with some information about what we do as farmers and to help you better understand pork, pork production's role in Minnesota. As I said, Minnesota is a home to more than 3,000 family farmers such as myself. We raise and sell between 16 and 17 million market hogs a year. Minnesota is the second largest pork producing state in the U.S. And as an industry, we employ more than 33,000 people both on the farms and in supporting and associated industries such as food manufacturing, transportation, and pork processing. The pork industry is diverse in its types of production practices, its scales, and the markets to which we supply our hogs. In 2021, pork sales contributed more than $3.34 billion to Minnesota's GPD, the GDP. Rather. Annually, 25 to 30 percent of all U.S. pork is exported to consumers around the world. While our farms and the greater pork supply chain contributes significantly to Minnesota, I am most optimistic and proud of the sustainability of our businesses that we have built throughout rural Minnesota. Big farmers remain committed to continuous improvement to all aspects of farming, socially, environmentally, and economically. As an industry, we've set sustainability goals that align with our six we care ethical principles, which are animal well-being, food safety, public health, our people, our communities, and the environment. Through this work, we have begun a reporting and verifying work. Through this, we've begun reporting and verifying the work that we have done, that we have done so that people who chose pork can feel confident in knowing farmers are doing the right thing for animals, people, and our environment. Like any other businesses, Pig farming is not without its challenges. I appreciate the previous work of this committee to support disease preparedness and response efforts as we try to keep foreign animal diseases such as African swine fever out of Minnesota and North America. As farmers, we go to great lengths to protect the health of our animals. It is reassuring to see investments made by our government that will help prepare and respond for animal disease outbreaks. As we continue, Building resilience on our farms, conservation remains foundational in our approach. We are thankful for the past and future support of this committee in helping remove barriers to implementing and adapting innovative practices in the areas of soil health. This will continue to allow farmers to further adapt technology and purchase equipment that will increase the precision which we can manage our farms, reduce killage, and plant cover crops where appropriate. We understand and embrace the responsibility we have to preserve and protect our shared natural resources for generations to come. And as a, farm, a fourth generation farmer and uh, I have a number of grandbabies, uh, there's nothing more to my heart than to leave this place uh, better than it was when I started. I encourage this committee to encourage, to continue engaging with farmers as we move forward. It is in our best interest that we share remains, that, we, that Minnesota remains a socially, environmentally, and economically sustainable state for raising pigs and providing pork 
to feeding hungry people here and around the world. As price takers, any additional fee, tax, or unnecessary regulatory burden diminishes opportunities for our farmers to start or to grow their businesses and puts Minnesota at a competitive disadvantage with other states. Thank you again for the opportunity for me to join you today. I hope, I can be, I hope you all can be proud of the work you do on this committee. It is especially important to us farmers to work to continue providing nutri nutritious, affordable, and safe food. Thank you for your support, and I look forward to working with you all. Thank you. Do you have Thanks any very much, President Anderson. Members, do you have any questions, comments? Senator Westrom? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm glad to have a, a Stearns County farmer here, uh, uh, also a constituent of mine, so welcome, uh, Mr. Anderson. And uh, with the pork producers, can you just give us an update on, uh, you mentioned ASF, uh, African swine fever, but we've been successful for several years now, keeping yep. it off. What's, what's the latest that you guys have heard as pork producers? Uh, well, I know it's always on your mind. President you know, Anderson. The federal government has done a very good job of uh, uh, patrolling our ports, uh, you know, keeping it off our shores. Of course, it's in Puerto Rico, uh, which isn't too far uh, from our shores. Uh, but so far, uh, I don't know if this is real wood or not, but uh, it's been, uh, it, we've been able to keep it out. And, uh, I know you, uh, you all probably remember the, uh, the challenges we had during COVID and having to euthanize pigs and such. Uh, you know, if ASF makes it here, that'll seem like uh, a, a happy dream compared to a nightmare. It, and it'll just be a, it's a lot of moving parts there. Senator Weston. No, th thank you, Mr. Chair. I just uh, so it's kind of stayed status quo. Uh, is Puerto Rico maybe a follow-up, uh, Mr. Anderson? Is it is it still there, or was it there and, and eradicated? Uh, what's what's the status there, Mr. Anderson? As far as I know, uh, it's still there. Uh, you might have to ask one of the state veterinarians that probably are more into that, but uh, I think it's there. They're working to eradicate it, but yeah, without much luck. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks for coming down. Thank you, members. Any other questions for President Anderson, Mr. Uh, Senator Dames? Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson, for being here. We appreciate uh, what you folks do and appreciate what the pork producers do. It was pleasant to have some of your folks stop by and have conversation with us in our office today. We truly do appreciate it. And Minnesota is one of the largest pork producers in the nation, so we do appreciate what the pork producers do in order to protect the industry, but also for the animal welfare and health. So thank you very much for being with us today and I uh, hope that you have a great year in the next year with the pork producers. Thanks, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, Senator. Members, any other questions or comments? Well, thanks very much for being here, President Anderson. We really appreciate you taking your time out of your day to come visit with us a little bit, and happy pork day to you. Thank you. Eat, some, eat a pork chop today. All right. <laughs> uh, members, our, our next step uh, on the agenda it has to do with a concern that we've heard a lot about uh, in visiting with farmers over the past couple months, but also uh, due to uh, uh, Senator Westrom's curiosity and concern on this issue, too. We wanted to have a day to talk about land ownership. Uh, and so our first uh, step in that conversation is a presentation about corporate farm and foreign ownership law uh, by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Uh, so we have Commissioner Peterson and General Counsel Mr. Spanier. Uh, gentlemen, whoever would like to go first, do you please uh, state your full name for the record and commit your testimony when you're ready. Thanks, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, Tom Peterson, Commissioner of Minnesota Department of Agriculture, and just want to thank you for uh, holding the hearing today on foreign ownership and corporate uh, farm law that we do have in Minnesota. It's, you know, it's been around since the 70s. We had a lot of concerns back then where we might have people from, I think it was Saudi Arabia at the time, uh, buying, you know, thousands and thousands of acres. And so the legislature, you know, chose to uh, work on some of these laws. And then also as we looked at uh, corporate ownership and then through the years in my career, I've worked on this law and I think that it works reasonably well. And so look forward to giving you the overview. I, I do get a lot of questions about it right now. Uh, you might be following the South Dakota legislature is uh, looking at foreign ownership. They don't have 
the type of law that we have. Uh, and then North Dakota is also, they're looking at their foreign ownership law. North Dakota is looking at their corporate ownership law uh, in trying to attract more livestock and modify their corporate farm law. So we get asked a lot, are certain countries buying farmland in Minnesota? To me, the answer right now is no. It doesn't mean that it doesn't, you know, couldn't happen or isn't happening. We don't uh, get reports of it. We don't see it happening. Um, and it uh, doesn't mean there isn't interest there in anything, but we do have a law, and just look forward to Mr. Spanier uh, going through that. So I'll turn it over to him. Mr. Chair, committee members, my name is Doug Spanier. I'm general counsel at the Department of Agriculture, and I have worked with the, the corporate farm law and the foreign ownership law for uh, ever since I started at the department back in the mid-'90s. Um, I can quickly get started for you here. <clears throat> the basic uh, way it works with the corporate farm law, Minnesota Statute 500.24, is there's a basic prohibition. So subdivision three of the statute says, no corporation, LLC, trust, or limited partnership should engage in farming or directly or indirectly own, acquire, or otherwise obtain any interest in agricultural land. So it's very broad. Right, so the two things is engaging in farming or having any interest in agricultural land. So if we break that down, who, who does it apply to? So it applies to corporations, limited liability companies, limited partnerships, triple LPs, and uh, irrevocable trusts. It does not uh, apply to individuals, general partnerships, or limited liability partnerships. So we go on then, what is considered farming? So the definition in the statute is the production of egg products, livestock or livestock products, milk or milk products, or fruit or other horticultural products. It goes on to say what is not farming, and that's the processing, refining, or packaging of said products, the production of timber or forest products, or the production of poultry or poultry products. So once they have that basic prohibition that says they can't do it, then it goes on to say, unless you can meet one of the exemptions listed in subdivision two. And there are over 19 different exemptions in subdivision two. Now, I will tell you at least 80% of those that qualify for the exemption fall under the family farm exemption. So it's either gonna be a family farm corporation, family farm partnership, a family farm LLC, or a family farm trust. And in order to qualify for those, a majority of the members or shareholders, whatever, have to be related. And then at least one of those related shareholders or partners has to actively engage in farming or reside on the land. So those are the two main things, right? So majority of the members have to be related and at least one of them resides on or actively operates. If, you are, if you're trying to qualify for a family farm trust, you don't need to meet that reside on or actively engage if you are leasing it to a qualifying entity. And then also if you're a family farm partnership or a family farm LLC, you don't need to meet that reside on or actively engage if one of those family members own the land for a period of five years before the transfer to the partnership or the LLC. So the next set is most common is the authorized farm entities. So, and those, and this would be where if you don't have, if you, obviously, if you're not coming together as a family, if you want to bring, you know, unrelated people together to create an entity, that you'd go through this authorized farm. And that's, uh, to meet that, you have to qualify for that. You can't have any more, any more than five members. So you're limited to five people. Um, they all have to be natural persons or trusts. And individuals holding 51% or more of the interest have to reside on the land or actively engage in farming. You're limited to 1,500 acres, whereas on the family farm, you don't, there's no limit on how many acres. But with the authorized farm, you can't have more than 1,500 acres. And the revenue from the rent and dividend and royalties can't exceed over 20%. So I did list here some of the other exemptions that are out there. They're, 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 we probably have a handful, maybe, less than five for each one of these, really. Um, the most common, I will say, is development organizations. There's a little bit more with that one. Uh, with the development organization, to qualify for that, uh, you have to be located, at, you can either be located in, a, in an incorporated area, so if you're located within the city, uh, or if you have, if you're using the land for a specific non-farming purpose, um, uh, those are the main ones, right? So uh, 
this is where your solar, your wind, because they're not using it for farming, they're, they're, they're using it for something non-farming wise. So if it's located within an incorporated area or if it's using, and if you have, also if you have plans to use it within six years for development, right? So you have to have documented plans to use it for, for development. And during that time, I think you have to have develop it within six years. And during that time, you can rent it out to somebody else. So it's within an incorporated area, using it for a non-farming purpose or if you're going to develop it within six years. Uh, you have the nonprofit corporation exemption. We have a couple that are in that. And then you have the commissioner's exemption, which is the one that you get a list of that. If you can't qualify for anything under the corporate farm law, you can apply to the commissioner for that. And if, you, if it doesn't uh, conflict with the purpose of the law or, you know, the, um, the, or on the purpose of the law or, any, or it doesn't have any impact, significant impact on the ag economy, then the commissioner can give that to you, and that's published on our website, and I believe you guys get a copy of that as well. Uh, to give you a clue on how many we're at, uh, when I started back in 1995, we had about 1,400 NADs certified. In 2010, it was up to 3,000, and in uh, 2021, we have about 7,000 entities. And part of that increase will also be because we added trusts in. At one point, I think I want to say in the, in the early 2000s, uh, the estate planners came to us to complain that they couldn't really use the corporate farm law for estate planning purposes for farmers, and so we allowed the family farm trust exemption in there. So we go on to the foreign ownership law. That's Minnesota Statute 500.221. And again, it starts with the basic prohibition. So no natural person may have an interest in agricultural land unless they are a citizen of the United States or they're a permanent resident alien. If you are a permanent resident alien, or a definition of a permanent resident alien is a natural person who's lawfully admitted to the United States for permanent residence or is a holder of a non-immigration treaty investment visa pursuant to U.S. code. If you are, under, if you are here as under the permanent residency, as, uh, you have to maintain your actual dwelling in the United States for at least six months out of every 12-month period. If you are a holder of the non-immigration treaty or non-immigration visa, you have to maintain your dwelling place in Minnesota for at least 10 months out of every 12-month period. It's only allowed for dairy farming and you're restricted to 1,500 acres. And that exemption is only good for three years unless you can show that you're actively pursuing citizenship. So currently we have, under this law, we have seven permanent residents that are under this and then we have one immigration visa holder and then we have three people who have been grandfathered in since the mid-70s when the law came into effect. If you are a business, uh, you're not allowed to have any interest in agricultural land unless 80% of each stock membership or the ultimate beneficial interest in the entity is held directly or indirectly by citizens of the United States or permanent resident aliens. And then that's the basic prohibition. And then again, this is where the exemptions come into play. There are a couple of them. There's, not as, there's only a handful. Um, common carriers, if you receive it through inheritance, but then you have to sell it within three years. Um, timber, mining, pipelines. Uh, there's a research one. Uh, there's a unique one for a vegetable processing facility for pollution rules. And then those rights secured by treaty. That's probably our most common one, is the rights secured by treaty. And uh, that's it. If you have any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Peterson and uh, uh, Mr. Spanier. Members, Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, um, I've got a few questions, uh, Mr. Spanier. Uh, maybe starting with the foreign ownership uh, that you just were talking about. Uh, you mentioned 80% uh, of the shareholders have to be, um, is it a U.S. citizen or a Minnesota resident? And, uh, and I guess my question then is the 20% or up to 20% may be a foreign, uh, foreign owner? Mr. Spanier. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Wilson, yes. Uh, it's 80% have to be a resident uh, of the United States or a permanent resident. So it only has to be have 80% interest. Okay, Senator so, so Mr. Chair, um, uh, Mr. Spanier, how, um, 
how does that square with the first corporate farm law? Then, um, I guess just in simple terms, how if, if an entity has 20% foreign ownership, uh, I didn't, I don't recall you listing one of the exemptions, but is that one of the 19 exemptions that they allow? So, th so that owner could own it as long as I don't know. What, is there an exemption? I, and then I've got some other follow-up questions on on the first part that are just would help be helpful to understand. Mr. Chair, Spanier. Uh, Senator Westrom, uh, an entity would have to meet the corporate farm law and the foreign ownership law. So they would, if it, you know, so let's say it's a, you know, if it's going to be a corporation, uh, a foreign-owned corporation, they're going to have to meet something under the corporate farm law as well. So you, so, you know, if they're going to, I don't, you know, I don't know how they would try to do it, right? So you can't, you wouldn't be a family entity if they wanted to do it as a, uh, an authorized farm or something, they're still limited to those five shareholders. But they would, they have, they have to meet both laws. Okay. Senator Westrom. And, and um, Mr. Spanier, just, just generally, how, um, how do we enforce the, the, the farm law um, and what happens when, I mean, land maybe 20 years ago was, was properly put into the, um, Owned, owned properly and the use was, was proper, but maybe somebody different rents it now that, that either qualifies or not qualifies. I mean, is there, a, as a practical matter, is there an easy way to, to oversee this? Uh, and how, how do we gen generally, how, do you, how does it generally get overseen uh, either at the front end when the transactions happen or 10 or 20 or 30 years later and land hasn't transferred any, changed any, changed any hands, but maybe the, the use is, the change. How, how, can you explain that to us a little bit? Mr. Spanier. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, sure. We, um, over the course of the years, we've tried to, I've, I've done a lot of education seminars with attorneys to try to explain the law to them so when they file the stuff. Um, we have on the Secretary of State's form when a uh, corporation wants to file, there's a question on that form that says, you know, are you going to engage in farming or have an interest in egg land? If so, you need to get to, you know, there's, an, uh, there's stuff on that form. I've also um, had many meetings with the county assessors, and the assessors can go on, on our website and put in the county, and they can see what entities uh, have, you know, have been certified by us, by county on there. And if, this, if, they're, if, if someone in their area hasn't been certified, they'll let me know. I mean, some counties are better than others, but uh, the county assessors, you know, they know who's, you know, they'll know through the transactions, they know who's, who is buying the land there and they can look and, and double check. Okay. And, and Mr. Chair, um, I've, got, I've got a handful of other questions, but I'm happy to let others ask and they might ask similar ones I have. So I'll just ask a couple more and then maybe leave it to others for a little while. Um, so Mr. Spanier, um, I guess on that answer, the county assessors, are they kind of, and is the recorders, do they play a role in that as well? But are they kind of on the front end and then the continual check check on this? And, and Or is there other enforcement? But then what's the penalty if somebody, uh, if it gets recorded and they, they violate this statute, uh, either right up front or, or 20 years later, uh, what's the penalty? Do they have to sell the land or... Uh, so, so both questions, if you can answer. Sure. Mr. Spanier. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom. Uh, the assessors, you know, they're sort of on the front line. They see these things. Uh, we don't, we aren't aware of every private transaction that takes place, right? And these right. things get recorded. So the assessors are sort of there to get that information. We also, I mean, we can try to find out about things in other ways. But once we do find out, we will send a letter to them. And it's, it's we enforce, we will send a letter to them, say you can't do this, you have to get into compliance. Um, you know the law requires. The law says that if you know we can go in, we can put the, we can try to we can have them sell the land. They get with the, they get five years after we go to court and prove that they that they they violated the law. They have five years in which to sell the land. Uh, but generally, we can work with them. Uh, you know, usually we get phone calls from lawyers who are like, "Hey, we want to do this," or "This is the latest thing we want to do," and we go through the law with them. And we tell them, "No, you can't do it. Right? This isn't possible." Uh, and then it's usually stopped. But if we do find out about somebody, we'll work with them to either get them into compliance or, you know, we just basically say, no, you can't do it, and you're going to have to sell. 
Oh, really? Okay. So they, so landowner, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Spanier, I mean, ultimately you have the authority to make them sell if they don't comply with, with, with the corporate firm law. Mr. Chair, Mr. Senator Spanier? Western. Yes. Okay. So Senator Western. one of the things, Mr. Chair, um, Spanier, you, you said, um, it doesn't, the corporate farm law doesn't apply to individuals, uh, general partnerships, or LLPs. Um, why, why, do, why doesn't it apply to them, and is that, is that loopholes? I mean, what would stop uh, a general partnership? It seems, it seems like if the intent is to keep local ownership and, and not foreign ownership, but they could come in and, and be an, either an individual general partnership or an LLP. Why, why doesn't it apply to that? If you could expand on that a little bit more, it would be helpful to understand. Mr. Spanier. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom. Well, you have to remember there's two separate laws here we're dealing with. First, with the corporate farm law, the reason why, so there's a specific provision in the corporate farm law that says that the law does not apply to general partnerships. So limited liability partnerships are a general partnership that elects to have limited liability. So therefore, it's a form of a general partnership, so it's not subject the, to the corporate farm law. Now, if a foreign, so, someone, and that doesn't apply to individuals either, but remember then, the foreign ownership law still takes effect. So if you were an individual, there's still the prohibition that you have to be a permanent resident or, you know, you have to be a permanent resident of the United States or under the immigration holder in order to own the farmland. Plus, you know, if a general, again, general partnership and those things would still apply where you'd have that 20, per, you know, 80 percent requirement. So you've got both laws you need to deal with. Senator Westrom. So, um, so I, I just find it a little, uh, I guess, ironic. Uh, I mean, the corporate farm law, LLP is very similar to an LLC. So why is LLP excluded from that? And and let me just blend into this question. I mean, LLCs 30 years ago weren't even allowed to be on farms, but we changed that law at the turn of the century, as I recall. Um, has that changed the implementation of this? And I would guess you've seen a lot more LLCs, uh, farms put into LLCs since. So uh, I guess blending those two questions together. It seems like LLPs and LLCs should be treated the same, but has, has, have things changed in the last 20 years with more LLCs uh, being, being a way of, a, a normal way of, of, of farming? Mr. Spanier. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, it, it just hasn't been, uh, I don't think, I guess it hasn't been brought up. Back. I mean, LLCs, we, we have a handful of LLCs. We don't have a lot of uh, them that have qualified on this. Um, I think LLPs, there's some dairies that are LLPs because it's an option for them uh, to, go, to go down that road. But I, I guess I haven't seen an influx on it. But I wouldn't know for sure since the LLPs don't have to file with us. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, that's, that's it for my questions right now. I'd like to open it up to other members. I don't want to dominate, but I've got a few others before we move on at, at the end. Donna Senator Westrom, it looks like you're the only show in town and you're asking some great questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Senator Kupek? Sure, I'll go, I'll go, Mr. Chair, and then I can turn it back. Um, I think I probably know the answer to this given the, the, uh, the presentation you just gave, but I hear, I hear lots of advertisements for investor groups in investing in farmland. And these are just speculators, and obviously we've seen the price of farmland go up dramatically. And I'm just wondering, is that something you could do in Minnesota, or is that just we're seeing that in other states? Mr. Spanier. Mr. Chair, Senator, I get a lot of calls on those two. It's, a, it's the, you know, it's the latest thing that wants to happen. And, and um, no, they're, they're not, they're generally not. I, I hesitate to say they can never do it because there's always, you know, the lawyers are always clever, right? Um, but for the most part, they can't. It's not, it's not a way to do it because you can't, there's, not, there's no exemption under the corporate farm law that allow for strictly investment purposes like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I do get calls on that, you know, from many, I mean, I get people from New York who call in and say, hey, we got this great idea, right? And it's usually under the guise of, we're going to buy this land and then we're going to give it to beginning farmers. And, and it's really a, a way of trying to just, 
you know, it, it's an investment for them to make their money. Uh, and it's not possible. There's no way to do this. It's, you know, to do the absentee landowner type thing and do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair. Um, so, Mr. Spanier, um, do, is there a minimum amount of land or a tract that, that, that this covers? Uh, let's say, you know, a farm, farm place uh, in the country, 10, 15, 20 acres, maybe five acres, two acres are tillable, but most of it's just a farm, farm place. Is that different than an, an 80 or 160 acre tract of land? Uh, or how do you, wh what's the threshold to, to apply uh, to this ownership? Mr. Spanier. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, uh, there is no threshold per se that you, know, you have to file if you have one acre or two acres, but there is an exemption for de minimis. So if, it's, if you have 40 acres or less and receive less than $150 per acre in rent or acre production, you qualify. And we, we put that in uh, in the 90s, I want to say. So. Okay. Senator Westrom. So, so Mr. Spanier, just um, stepping back a little bit, with the corporate farm laws, and then I kind of want to conclude with some thoughts that you'd have if, if there's loopholes or if there's things we've seen, and, and I don't know if loopholes is really the right word, but just uh, that's changed since, since this law was put in place. But stepping back, what, what was the reason Minnesota moved ahead with this law uh, you kind of touched on it at the beginning, but if you could expand on that a little bit more. And, and, and right or wrong, I think many people think it's to kind of keep ownership within Minnesota residents, within individuals, not big corporations, the corporate farmers that, that were talked about a lot in the 80s and 90s. Um, but, but as I review this and what you're reviewing, Basically, anybody in the United States could own the farmland here in Minnesota, but they'd have to be an individual general partnership or an LLP. Um, is, is that correct? Uh, and then just cover kind of the broad background of what, what was this intending to cover when, we, when it was put into place? Commissioner Peterson? Mr. Spanier. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom. So the law came into effect in the 1970s, uh, early 70s. Um, I wasn't around back then, but I can tell you from what I understand, it was in the Midwest. I mean, most of these laws came into effect in the, in the, uh, in the Midwest. They were worried about foreign ownership at the time. Um, the, also, with the, with, and that was with the foreign ownership law, right? They were worried about, I believe, I want to say Germans and some Chinese that at that time they were buying land in the 70s. Uh, the corporate farm law, they were worried about uh, the limited liability aspect, that an entity could pollute the land and then be able to walk away because they have this limited liability. And so they put these requirements in, and, they, and I believe the theory was, of course, that uh, if someone, if a shareholder was actually on the land, so that's why we tie it to, they have to be engaged in farming or residing on the land, that if, they, if there's someone that's living there and they're not absentee landowners, they'd be more apt to take care of the land. And, that, and they didn't want to have these absentee landowners with having and having limited liability. Senator Western. But Mr. Spanier, Mr. Chair, uh, am I correct though? Somebody from South Dakota or Texas could own the land even if they're an individual or, or a general partnership, uh, say two people or, or, or more in a general partnership? Or Mr. Spanier. Yes. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, yes, they could. Uh, I know back in the early 2000s, there were uh, a lot of there were several lawsuits involving the corporate farm law uh, when states were trying to restrict a little bit. And uh, some of those issues were when they were saying um, on this engaging in farming aspect, uh, if you had to actually be on the farm and, and uh, you get your boots dirty and do all that. It was a uh, reverse commerce clause issue, and they couldn't do that. Uh, there was also some ADA claims that said you can't do that as well in South Dakota. Um, but yes, an individual in, uh, in South Dakota would be able to own farmland in Minnesota. Um, 
as an individual, even if they wanted to try to do it as an entity, they, they probably they could possibly, but they're still going to have to meet some sort of engaging and farming aspect to it. Okay. So, interesting. so Mr. Chair, um, Mr. Spanier, just a, just a few more questions, but I appreciate the answers. It's, I, I think, insightful. But uh, what um, w would you have any suggestions? I mean, as somebody that's seen this for years in the Department of Agriculture, um, this past year I've had more inquiries from a lot of farmers and just the public reading about, uh, I don't know, a story up in North Dakota, out by Grand Forks, uh, supposedly China was buying a few quarters or, or sections of land. Um, people were talking about that a lot in my area. Um, I don't know if that happened to go, go, go through or not, but could that happen here in Minnesota, uh, if you're familiar with those facts? And my sense is, our laws are different than what North Dakota or other, many other states have, so, so we're, we're so-called so ahead of the game, or at least uh, that wouldn't be allowed here in Minnesota. But uh, would that, and what, what suggestions would you have for our committee that maybe have come about uh, that, that is a gray area, or questions or th transactions that have gone through that, that maybe some groups or some people say, go beyond the intent of what the law was. If you could just comment on those, I'd appreciate it. Commissioner Peterson? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Senator Westrom, I, I'd just comment on that. You know, and I think that in reading the articles that you read, I get the same, you know, calls and questions that certain countries <laughs> are buying up farmland in North Dakota or a very, 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 very wealthy American is buying farmland in, you know, uh, uh, different parts of the country. And so, the, to me, the answer is no, they could not uh, buy like a, a, a foreign country, but an individual, if they meet the qualifications, it doesn't matter if they're a very wealthy individual. Um, it may not be something we like, but if they meet the qualifications, uh, they can't. You know, and so I think that uh, under our law, I think our law has worked uh, reasonably well. I think that uh, when we do get uh, complaints or we get uh, questions, and to be honest, sometimes it's a neighbor turning in a neighbor. Uh, you know, we talked a lot about assessors and county uh, uh, auditors and people like that, but a lot of times we get calls and we'll say, hey, I think somebody owns this land that doesn't own, the, that shouldn't own this land. Can you look at that? It doesn't happen very often, but it does happen. And so uh, I think our, our law does work very well. There are uh, some pieces that might need to be updated. Uh, there's a, 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 rental, uh, a rental piece that's in there that's kind of low. Um, but other than that, you know, I think our law has served us uh, reasonably well. Is that and, Mr. and to, to that point, uh, Commissioner Peterson or Mr. Spanier, would there be a limitation on uh, an American or a corporation? What, 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 be, what would be the limitations? And, and I guess, I mean, the, the name I've heard a lot is the Bill Gates Foundation, but I'm sure I've also heard of others, CNN and other people that have owned a lot of land out in North Dakota. Would there be a limitation on how much they could own in Minnesota? Or, and, and if so, what would be those limitations? Mr. Chair, Mr. Spanier. Senator Westrom, uh, you know, if, it depends on how he sets it up, right? I, I don't know how he, you know, he's, if, if somebody wants to set up, if it says an individual, they can have as much as they want. Uh, if, if they can set it up some way to, to meet our corporate farm law, I'm not sure how they could, but, you know, they got enough lawyers involved, they could probably figure out something. But uh, there, some of those, some, most of these exemptions don't have acreage limitations on them. The only one that has the acreage limitation on is the authorized farm one when you're trying to bring non-family members together, and that's a 1,500 acre limitation. Uh, but again, I don't know how he would, I, I don't know how somebody would fit under that. I mean, if you're buying it as an individual, you can have as much as you want. And, and Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Spanier, that 1,500 acres would probably be one of the limitations if it was non-family members farming. Mr. Spanier. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, yes. If they were trying to, if, he was, if, if someone was trying to do a, a, an authorized entity where you have less, where you have to have five non, you know, if you're, you're limited to five non-related 
members coming together or five members all together and then you're limited with that 1500 acre thing but you also remember 51 percent of the interest of that has to be someone who's residing on or actively engaged in farming so they'd have to have somebody here that would have 51 percent interest too it and mr chair on, on that somebody that has to in that in that organ in that uh, partnership or, or five member business structure it doesn't have to be a relative, but they, one of them would have to be a farmer. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, if you're trying to do the authorized farm partnership or an authorized farm uh, corporation, yeah, you, you're limited to five shareholders, and at least one of those shareholders has to reside on, or at, the, at least 51% of it, they have to be uh, engaged in farming or have an interest in, you know, and do that. So I see. they're going to be tied to that. They're tied to the land somehow. And they have to be, all five have to be natural persons too. So you can't start throwing in extra entities. Okay. And, and, and I think, Mr. Spanier, um, what, what about processing plants or other uh, land in Minnesota? I, I would guess that doesn't fall under this because uh, I hear concerns about uh, China or other countries owning a majority interest in some processing plants and things like that, that doesn't apply here. Is that is that correct or or does it? Mr. Spanier. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom, that's correct. So this only deals with engaging in farming or having an interest in egg land. So if it gets into the processing, and I, I think that's what was in North Dakota, right? I think they were buying a milling facility or something like that. So that would be outside the corporate farm law. Uh, uh, Senator Kanesh, do you have something? I'm sorry, we'll come right back to you in just a moment. You go right ahead. I'm, I just had one question left. So, Oh, yeah, actually, feel free, Mr. Westrom, if you want to do that. So I guess, and Mr. Spanier, I kind of asked this, but any anything you would, from, from the questions and just the topic that you would suggest or, or raise just for us to know, that would be, be changes we should update. Uh, Commissioner Peterson touched on it, but... I get the feeling you work with this almost week in and week out. Uh, just any comments you'd have for us as a committee? Mr. Spanier. Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom. You know, we the de minimis exemption that I talked about, it's, it's 40 acres or less, and they have to receive less than $150 in egg rent or production. That $150 came in in, uh, boy, 20, I don't know when we, it's probably, I think it was early 2000s. So I don't know if that number would need to get moved up given given where we're at today, um, or if you wanted to move that de minimis exemption anywhere. But that's about it. I will tell you, I've talked to people, you know, with the feds and everything like that, and Minnesota is known for having one of the toughest corporate farm laws and foreign ownerships, and that we actually enforce on it as well, compared to some other states. So. Thank you, Mr. Spanier. Uh, Senator Kunish. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. My question sort of followed up with um, what the senator was asking. Outside of agriculture, and I, I'm kind of wondering um, how and why agriculture became kind of a, and maybe not unique, um, entity for not allowing corporate land ownership. Are there other reasons or examples or um, entities where we, where we don't allow um, foreign entities to purchase our land in Minnesota? Do you know? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Spanier? Senator, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know of any other areas, but I, you know, I just, you know, I think you know, obviously they were, they, uh, you know, there's a belief that the farmland uh, needs to be protected, uh, and, and you know, that's i I know under the Foreign Investment Disclosure Act, uh, the Feds have some requirements on on foreign ownership and what they what they cover. I don't know exactly what that is, but I know there is some requirements on the, on the, at the federal level when when the when a foreign ownership or question when they when they have to file with the feds, a corporation does. There are some requirements at that level, but I don't know exactly what those are. Thank you, Mr. Spanier. Members, any other questions or comments? Mr. Spanier, Commissioner Peterson, thank you so much for that edifying discussion. Also, thanks to, to Senator Westerman, and Senator Kunish, and uh, Senator Dames for, for uh, encouraging that conversation to get to the depth that it did. Um, uh, members, you know that we have a, a pretty busy schedule today. Uh, so uh, folks in the public are testifiers. As we move into our discussion of specific bills, I'm going to ask you testifier folks to be as efficient as you possibly can. 
Uh, that means I'd like to see our presentations and our testimonies between two to three minutes. Uh, I realize that that might not be what you'd planned for, but I'm going to ask you to expedite and be efficient as you possibly can. Uh, so our first bill uh, for discussion is Senate File 1575, uh, Senator Seeberger, Agricultural Down Payment Assistant Grants Appropriation. Mr. Chair. Senator Western. Just as uh, we're getting started, um, we, we kind of had a brief conversation at the beginning of the committee, but just uh, would you be able to just indicate to the members, to all of us, what bills you intend to have a vote on and which bills you think will be laid over? Certainly, Mr. Westrom. Uh, Senate Files 1575, the bill we're about to hear, will be laid over for potential inclusion. Uh, Senate File 1879, the beginning farmer tax credit that I will present uh, when Senator Seberger is done. We will vote to, see, uh, to send it to taxes. And then our last presentation for the day, our last bill, will be Senate File 228, uh, Senator Kupek's grain indemnity account establishment appropriation. We will vote on that to send it to state government. Senator Sieber, when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Um, I am here before you to present Senate file number 1575, which deals with agricultural down payment assistant grants um, and requests an appropriation for the program. This bill appropriates $750,000 in fiscal years 24 and 25 from the general fund to the Commission of Agriculture to award down payment assistant grants. Of the amount appropriated each year, at least $375,000 is for down payment assistance for emerging farmers. If this requirement is not met by March 1st of each year, the commissioner can award the remaining funds to eligible farmers. Emerging farmers means farmers who are American Indian or Alaskan Natives, Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, Asian, Pacific Islander, members of a community of color, women, veterans, persons with disabilities, LGBTQIA+, or any other emerging farmers as, de as determined by the commissioner. The Minnesota Down Payment Assistance Grant offers dollar per dollar matching up to $15,000 for qualified farmers purchasing their first farm. The grant program is administered by RFA as part of its mission to develop the state's agricultural resources. Um, this is a pre-existing program. It started last year. It started with $500,000, uh, uh, an appropriation of $500,000 with each applicant receiving up to $15,000. And I believe I have two testifiers here who can um, uh, give you a little more information about this when the commission is ready. No, I have one testifier, my bad. No, I have two. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Seberger. Uh, I believe uh, Ms. Dore, Dore, uh, Dore um, Douglas County vegetable farmer. Uh, Ms. Dore, if you are online, if you could uh, unmute your microphone, turn on your camera, and state your full name for the record, and to correct my pronunciation, and commence your testimony when you're ready. And good afternoon. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to thank the committee for this opportunity to testify. My name is Naima Dore. I am a proud first-generation farmer. I've been farming with my family since 2016. And honestly, you know, we've been struggling for a long time uh, with the land access. Um, we had many failed attempts, but I'm happy to share with you today that I um, closed on my farm um, a few weeks ago. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, my family and I were not able to access the down payment assistant um, program. Um, I believe it's a great program. Uh, we learned a lot for, from, from the first round, excuse me, um, and um, I support the bill, but I think because of our unique situation with um, our deadline for, for the purchase, uh, we were listed on a wait list um, and we just couldn't access that fund a timely matter, especially working with the Farm Service Agency uh, going through that process. It is a lengthy process. So for us, it was just a challenge of matter of um, receiving the fund um, by the time that we were ready to close. And that's why today I'm here to share my experience and my family story. Um, there's a lot of opportunity here for us to um, carry over to the next round. And I believe that allowing uh, the emerging farmers like myself who 
are doing the work and serving the community by providing fresh produce. Uh, we can use the support. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Dari. Our next presenter is uh, Ms. Schreiber. Uh, Ms. Schreiber, if you would please state your full name for the record uh, and start your commencement, uh, commencement testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Chair Putnam and members. My name is Laura Schreiber. I am a policy organizer with the Land Stewardship Project and personal hat on aspiring farmer. So excited about this program. Um, the Land Stewardship Project is a grassroots organization working to support small and mid-sized farmers, support more sustainable and regenerative practices on the landscape, and working for a more just um, farm and food system through our programmatic and policy work. For 41 years, LSP has worked to keep farmers on the land and support the next generation of farmers for beginning farmer training programs and our land access and land legacy work. Land access is the single biggest issue um, for beginning and emerging farmers. I hear this time and time again when I'm traveling across the state talking with our members. Right now, farmers can expect anywhere um, to see prices anywhere from $6,000 to $13,000 an acre for farmland. Um, no matter where you are in the state, from Dakota County to Yellow Medicine County, prices have drastically increased in recent years for farmland, which is why you see more and more farmers renting or buying marginal land. This is why the Farmland Down Payment Assistance Program is such a game changer, um, especially for those without inheritable land or capital. This program also represents an opportunity to level the playing field for black, brown, indigenous, and immigrant farmers in Minnesota who historically have been discriminated against by lenders or typically don't have access to capital um, or have been forcibly removed from their land. In partnership with our allies at the Latino Economic Development Center, um, Midwest Farmers of Color Collective, and the Somali American Farmers Association, we've developed recommendations um, to further strengthen this program and are grateful for the opportunity to work with Senator Seberger um, and MDA to make this program more accessible and equitable. This program um, first launched its application period not too long ago, and we saw just how popular and important this program is with how quickly um, the application window closed due to funds no longer being available. So thank you for increasing the funding to 750,000 per year. Um, however, we do recommend that there be a 30-day application window um, as those who work, have children, or have poor rural broadband uh, may not be able to apply in a short window and first come first serve models have, um, are not as equitable. This would also allow MDA to evaluate applications and support applicants who need the funds the most. Um, lastly, another concern that we have heard is the requirement to use these funds within 90 days, um, like Naima was sharing too. Depending if a farmer is utilizing a farm service agency loan that can take anywhere from six to nine months um, for the, everything to line up. So we recommend increasing this window to allow for farmers accessing these programs to be eligible and match these funds with FSA loans. Thank you again to Senator Seberger and the MDA for their hard work on this program. I urge the committee to support it. Um, it's an incredible program that can help bolster our farm economy, repopulate rural communities, and make dreams a reality for a lot of farmers who want to own land. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Trevor. Members, uh, questions? Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Senator Seberger, do you know if this program that was instituted uh, last biennium uh, has been fully used by the Department of Agriculture for emergent farmers? If, if, has all the money been used up? Senator Seberger? Mr. Chair and Senator Anderson, it's my understanding, yes. In fact, it's been so popular that um, there's more demand than there is um, availability. Uh, thank so, you, uh, Senator Seberger. Just to follow up, Senator follow Anderson, if I may, that um, just one second to sort of flesh out Senator Seberger's answer is that there were 28 applications in the first five minutes of its opening, and it was uh, oversubscribed before the day was done. Okay. So your follow up, Senator Anderson? Uh, thank you. Uh, it says here in uh, line 1.9 to 110 that if the commissioner uh, did not find emerging farmers, that he could give that give an award to any eligible farmer. And I'm wondering if that was utilized or not. I mean, this is new language, but it sounds like it probably could have been used last time, too. Do you know for sure if that was done to a, for an eligible farmer or not? Senator Seberger? 
My understanding is that uh, the funds were all awarded to emerging farmers as that uh, term is defined. Um, and I will say in response to the um, overwhelming demand of the program, um, I have been in con conversations with um, other stakeholders and I think there is a way to retool the language a little bit to ensure that um, on a first come first serve basis they aren't all snatched up but rather we can have a, a, a window of an application process and then applicants can be considered. So that's language that we're talking about and, and working with um, to ensure that the program um, really meets the needs of those who um, can benefit from it. Thank you. Senator Kunish. Thank you, Senator Seberger. I wish this was around when I was younger. I might have taken advantage. I always wanted to be a farmer, always. Um, my question is, is, do you have any kind of a breakdown of who the recipients of those grants are? How many women, um, different folks of color? Even if you have any idea, like, what kind of farming were they doing? Anything like that? Senator Seberger? Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and Senator Kunish. I wonder if MDA is here and maybe would have that information. Mr. McDevitt? If you would please state your full name for the record. <clears throat> Good afternoon, uh, Chair Putnam, members. Uh, my name is Matt McDevitt. I'm the uh, Ag Finance Supervisor for the Rural Finance Authority. Um, Senator, in answer to your question, uh, the breakdowns were is the emerging farmer definition, which we just asked broadly, not, not specifically, but broadly 33% um, of the awardees would be considered emerging farmers, uh, but 49% of the overall applications we took in were um, uh, emerging farmers. Um, the, the types of practices they're doing, it, it was pretty much all over the board. I mean, there, obviously there, there was more, you know, kind of vegetable type farming type things, but, you know, it was a mixture. There's bees, there's flowers, there's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, so. Senator Kunish? Do you have any idea how many um, awardees were women? Mr. McDevitt. Mr. Chair, members, uh, not specifically. Again, the question was just very, very broad. If you, if you were considered an emerging farmer at this at this point, uh, we we can definitely entertain adding some optional demographic questions in, in the future on, on the application to break that down further if that's deemed um, what everybody wants to do. Just Sorry, that Chris. would be really great to see those demographics. I think it would be encouraging to a broad variety of folks to see that. Oh, there's women that are getting these. There are, you know, African Americans. You know, whatever. Um, if you had those demographics, or if they're on the website, that would be really. I would suggest doing that. Thank you. Members, any other questions? Senator Western. Mr. Chair, um, I guess to the author and maybe the department, uh, with the list of categories of emerging farmers, how it strikes me that some of them would be a little difficult to decide if somebody fits in that category or not. How, how do they fit into that category or not? Uh, how, do you, how do you determine that? Mr. McDevitt? Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Westrom, uh, so the to be a beginning farmer, there there was there was just qualification questions, as it were, you know, to, to fit within the bill to make sure that you you qualified. We did ask separate questions: Were you a beginning farmer, more generally, and then the emerging farmer a little more broadly, you know, with with the definition expanded to to you know the, the language that's in the bill currently. Um, but it, but it wasn't a requirement. We just we just were asking the questions: the beginning farmer and the emerging, just kind of as a um, general demographic type type question. Senator Western. So, so Mr. Chair, is that a, uh, does that become a criteria that is determinative of, of, of them getting the grant or not? Um, and, and is it mostly through an attestation clause that somebody's attesting they're disabled if, even though you visually may not be able to see a disability on somebody? I mean, if they're not in a wheelchair, it's harder to tell sometimes if it's a back injury or a soft tissue injury, uh, or do you require uh, medical records, or or is it just through an attestation if, if they fit in one of those categories? 
Mr. McDevitt. Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Westrom, uh, it is attestation. We, we do not require that they provide proof of any of those types of statements. Members, any further questions, comments? Okay. Senator Sieberger, uh, closing comments. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the commission. Um, I'm thrilled to be supporting this program. Um, and uh, look forward to working with the stakeholders further to make this the very best program that we can. Thanks. Senate File 1575 will be laid over possible inclusion. Senator Putnam, you have a bill, uh, a Senate file 1879 to present, and I understand you do have an author's amendment? Uh, I do, Mr. Chair. Uh, I move the, um, I believe it's A1 amendment. Mr. Chair, what this amendment does is it clarifies the bill and makes some changes that were requested by the Department of Agriculture. Uh, when we originally drafted the language, we thought that uh, the Minnesota Department of Agriculture needed money to administer the program, but remarkably, they say they don't want it. Uh, fortunately, and with the funding allocated last year, they don't need it, so we've stuck that from the bill. We've also clarified that family members can participate in the purchase of agricultural land specifically. And finally, we've requested some additional reporting to the legislature that would shed some light on the effects of some of these changes. That is the nature of the amendment that I offer. Okay. Uh, to the author amendment, uh, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? It is adopted. You may go ahead and present your bill. Mr. Chair, members, thanks for hearing this bill. It's a really important one. I'm excited to have the opportunity to present for your consideration Senate File 1879, which would expand Minnesota's incredibly successful beginning farmer tax credit. Now, we all know that farming is capital intensive. We've just heard about that for the last hour. Land, equipment, livestock are all incredibly expensive and getting more expensive as the days pass. This creates real challenges for young people and others who want to get started in farming. And we also know that farmers are aging out of this profession and lifestyle. We need to help new people farm. Now we all know this is a math situation, requiring resources, but it's also a human situation. We heard stories about this need at our uh, town hall listing session out in Piers a couple months ago. We all know that we need to continue to invest in and to support new people farming, and this is a very successful way of doing exactly that. Now, we've been doing this in the past. In 2017, Minnesota was among the first in the nation to pass a tax credit to help beginning farmers get onto land. This law provides existing farmers an incentive to rent or sell agricultural assets to beginning farmers, helping them buy land, broker relationships, and get established in their operations. To date, well over a thousand new farmers have been helped by this program, and it continues to grow in popularity. Now, more concretely, these are some of the changes that we've done in this particular bill and what it's actually going to do. First, more importantly, this bill will eliminate the sunset of the program. Without our action, this credit will expire in December of this year. Second, this bill would increase the credit for the sale of agricultural assets from 5 to 8 percent and up to $50,000. At present, a minority of farmers use this credit for the sale of agricultural assets. The beginning farmer tax credit as a whole is about rental or uh, sale, and the sale component uh, of the program is less popular than the rental one. Uh, so much like home ownership, though, owning ag land is how farmers build generational wealth, and we want to make sure that farmers are afforded that opportunity. Uh, third, uh, for black, indigenous, and farmers of color, my bill would increase the credit for sale of agricultural assets to 12%, giving them an extra leg up. Uh, now, uh, the definition of socially disadvantaged farmer, which is actually specifically what this refers to, is a federal definition and a function of the USDA. Uh, DA. Uh, if in the past, uh, over history, if the USDA has excluded a particular population from some of its work, that is the definition of a socially disadvantaged farmer. It is not an expansive definition. It's a very concrete, specific legal one with a very concrete, specific legal trajectory in history. 
Fourth and finally, this bill would expand the credit to family members for sale of agricultural land, allowing children and grandchildren to use this credit to assist with generational farm transition. Uh, as any farm will tell you, generational transition is complex and costly. And this is something that we hear a awful lot about. Uh, is that the challenge of passing on your land to future generations. Now, uh, equally important, all these changes are made within the current funding cap of $6 million per year with the remainder carrying forward. We've also retained the credit for beginning farmers to pay for farm business management courses and have maintained income limitations under the original bill. Finally, and before I turn to my testifiers, I want to, testifiers, I want to highlight the 19 agricultural organizations who signed a letter of support in your packet that uh, supports this, these changes. It's a testament to the value of this credit, and I'm eager to carry it forward to the next generation of farmers in our state. And now, Mr. Chair, if I may, if we could turn to our testifiers. Thank you, Senator Putnam. Our, our, I believe our first testifier is on Zoom. Uh, it is Molly Byron. We see you there. So if you could just uh, state your name and begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Molly Byard, and it is my dream to transition my family farm located in Waseca, Minnesota to the next generation. On behalf of myself and Minnesota Farmers Union, I'm here to testify in strong support to expand and improve access to the beginning farmer tax credit, allowing family members to participate and utilize the credit proposed by Agriculture Chair Putnam. Thank you so much for your leadership on this. I come from a multi-generational farm family where I'm part of the sixth generation to grow up on my farm. However, I didn't always know that I wanted to transition my family farm. When the pandemic hit in 2020, I found myself back home on the farm after living out of state for over 10 years. I ended up reconnecting with my agricultural roots and enrolled in farm business management at South Central College to learn how to manage my family farm while also utilizing the farm business management scholarship for beginning farmers. I am now in my third year of the program and a member of the South Central College's Farm Business Management Advisory Board. Through this experience, I have had the opportunity to personally hear from farm business management instructors across the state about how much the beginning farm tax credit has changed the playing field for new and young farmers they work with. The beginning farm tax credit has become so critical to farm. Today, it is nearly impossible to farm without some kind of assistance. Young people can't just compete. And this bleeds into our rural communities, affecting other businesses and our schools. And there are so many young farmers in Minnesota who wish to transition their generational family farm, but right now do not have the same opportunity for assistance. In most cases, we cannot afford to transition our farms by ourselves. Expanding the beginning farm tax credit could potentially alleviate farmland from going on the market for sky high prices because more would consider and actually could take over a family farm. Just last week, I attended a two day multi-generational farm transition retreat at South Central College with my family. And at this retreat, the room was completely filled with other farm families across Minnesota. The facilitators share that this was the largest group of families they have ever had in over the 10 years they have been putting this retreat on and even had to stop advertising the retreat because they ran out of space. So I am not alone and there are so many farm families just like my own. Right now, I honestly don't know if I'll be able to financially transition my family farm and that reality is extremely overwhelming. But this is the reality for most farm families in Minnesota who have hopes of finding a way to continue their farm beyond the current generation. Thank you for your opportunity, the opportunity to share my support and that of Minnesota Farmers Union and for your support of beginning farmers. I'm happy to stand for any questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Ms. Byron. Uh, next, we will call up to uh, the stand here, Kelsey Zavidra. Hopefully I said that correctly. Saavedra. Saavedra. Good job, though. It was close. <laughs> One vowel off. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. Saavedra, you can begin your testimony. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Kelsey Saavedra, and I'm an emerging farmer in Chisago County. On my farm, I grow heirloom vegetables, I save seed, and raise pastured chicken for meat. Most of what I produce is sold directly off my farm and to customers. Um, and I'm also one of the designated local VeggieRx program farmers. If you're not familiar with that, it's a, state, um, a statewide program that addresses food insecurity and health issues by ways of physicians prescribing um, vegetables in our local clinics. So what I'm getting at is people depend on small farms like mine to put actual food on their tables every week. Now, having a background in agriculture and significant experience, farming did not help me 
in my journey to find and secure land, it took me nearly six years to find anything remotely possible or, or affordable. And I ended up settling for a piece of marginal raw land that was parceled off from a farm that went under in the 1980s farming crisis. As you can imagine, access to land directly determines who has the opportunity to succeed in agriculture. 37% of my county's land is used for agriculture. With its close proximity to the metro, it's ideal for specialty growers like myself so that we can get our product to the consumers. This proximity is also ideal for real estate, or for developers, um, and people who wish to get out of the city. This current real estate market is fiercely competitive, and it leaves little to no room for emerging farmers to access the land that we need. I need you to know that there is no shortage of farmers like me who want to be on the land. However, land access is our greatest barrier to being able to, to grow food for our communities and young farmers are actively leaving agriculture because they cannot access land. Today, I am here in support of both the continuation and the expansion of the Beginning Farmer Tax Credit Program. I'm confident that we all want to see emerging farmers have better access to land ownership and this program, in addition to the down payment grant, addresses that. Thanks again for your time. And if you're ever up in Chisago County, please stop by the farm. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Zerveda. Uh, next, we have Jane Winsberger. If you just state your name and you begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the, uh, the committee. Uh, for the record, my name is Jane Winsberger. I'm originally from Kenya, born and raised in a, in a farm. Um, I immigrated here in 1998, went to school to be a nurse, worked in the nursing industry for 20 plus years before I decided to go back to farming, farming being my, my roots. Um, I, I own a farm in uh, Oglovy, Kennebec County, Minnesota. I have uh, 3.8 acres and most of it is wetland. That is what I could afford. I grow naturally organic uh, vegetables and cultural vegetables as well. So I see the state of Minnesota is working to better serve the communities like mine, but there is an opportunity to do more. Uh, today, I'm asking you to expand this uh, beginning farm tax credit so that the people who look like me can benefit, since it's too hard to buy a land for the emerging farmers, immigrant community. It, it took me a long time to have a farm. I took like um, 10 years looking for a place to, to farm. I faced, I faced more challenges um, by this, getting these 3.8 acres. Uh, still, with the farm, I have challenges. Unfortunately, these challenges are not unique to people like me. Uh, they and other underserved communities in the great state of Minnesota. So by expanding this tax credit program, we help decrease the challenges the beginning farmers face to acquire land. Incentives like this will help be, uh, beginning farmers participate in this competitive real estate market since the current real estate is very challenging market for people who look like me. So Mr. Sir, Thank you so much for having me here. Thank you so much for what you are doing for us as that, that we can have equal shares in farming as Minnesotan farmers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Winsberger. Uh, we have one last testifier, and that would be Leif Ockrey from uh, Ag Country Farm Credit Services. And if you could just state your name for the record, then you can be in your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the Senate Agricultural Committee for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the Minnesota Beginning uh, Farmer Tax Credit. My name is Life Ockrey. I farm near Stephen, Minnesota in the northwest corner, and I serve on the board of directors for Ag Country Farm Credit Services, where our customer base includes about 6,900 beginning farmers. 
I was an instructor in the farm operation and management program at Northland College in East Grand Forks for 24 winters. And there we worked with uh, young men and women who were transitioning back to the farm business. And most of them would return back to their family farms. This is a very challenging time for the beginning farmers to transition into a farming operation. With the high cost of land, machinery, livestock, and facilities, as well as inflation and high input prices, it's difficult to compete with the more established producers. The Minnesota Beginning Farm Tax Credit has been an effective tool in giving the beginning farmer an opportunity to build a relationship with a retiring farmer. A tax credit to the owner of the property, whether it's a land sale or a land rental arrangement or the sale of machinery to the beginning farmer can be an opportunity that he or she would need to get started. The problem with the beginning farmer tax credit as it currently stands is the fact that the vast majority of beginning farmers work directly with uh, family members, such as parents, grandparents, aunts and uncles. These family members are not eligible for the credit. For this reason, the program has been underutilized even though the funding has been allocated under the statute. Our son Brent and his family joined our farming operation about five years ago after working a seven, years, or a seven year career as a civil engineer. He always had a passion for farming and now is in the process of transitioning into our farming operation. However, Brent, like many beginning farmers, is unable to benefit from these tax credits because of the provisions of the program. Senator Putman's um, bill to expand eligibility to include family members would allow many young families to transition into farming and encourage a new generation of family farmers to succeed. These young farmers will have the opportunity to raise their families in our rural communities, attend local schools and churches, and support rural towns. It appears the bill will include family members only for the sale of the agricultural assets and not rental. It would be ideal if the bill was modified to also include the rental of agricultural assets, as this is how most farmland is transitioned in a family farm. I support the provisions of Senator Putnam's bill and would encourage your support as well. Thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of SF 1879. Thanks, Mr. Ockrey. Thanks for making also the long drive down from Stephen and uh, go storm. Mr. Chair, it's odd to hear a weatherman say that. Good. So, uh, move on to uh, discussion. Questions for on the bill? Seeing none, Senator Putnam, would you like to uh, move your own bill? Uh, certainly. Before I do, though, Mr. Chair, I'd like to thank our uh, uh, group of co-authors, uh, Senators Weber, Dedzik, Dornick, and Frentz, who all helped us uh, take care of this. I think it's going to do a lot of good, and I appreciate the support of the committee. So, Mr. Chair, I move that Senate File 1879 is amended, be recommended to pass, and re-referred to the Committee on Taxes. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Done. So moved. Members, the next issue that we address is going to be kind of complicated. So we thought it would be prudent to first have uh, our friends from the Department of Agriculture and a friend from the fruit, grain, and vegetable section uh, to come uh, tell us a little bit more about the recent grain, Admi grain advisory group report. So we're going to have a presentation, if we could, by uh, Commissioner Peterson and Mr. Milanowski. Uh, gentlemen, if you would please state your full name for the record and uh, commence your testimony when you're ready. Thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, again, Tom Peterson, uh, Commissioner of the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. And I want to thank the committee for uh, hearing this report today. This issue of uh, grain indemnity has been around uh, quite a while. Uh, it really started many years ago and uh, uh, that I can recall in my career with uh, uh, an elevator and porter and, 
I don't know if that's still in your district, Senator Dames, but it was at one time, I know, and uh, that was a, uh, a failure that brought the legislature to first discuss this issue, and then uh, we had uh, uh, another uh, failure that came a couple years ago uh, in Ashby, in Senator Westrom's uh, area, uh, which was followed by uh, one in Carlstad, Northwest Minnesota, and uh, Wadena, and then uh, a couple in uh, of uh, organic uh, 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 facilities in uh, Hope. And uh, so this has been a, uh, an issue that I've really taken personally a lot since 2019. The one, one thing that I stands out as we go through these and we um, uh, uh, go through our bonding requirements and then find out what the farmers are going to get for their payout and we, f we find out and I visit with our Attorney General as they look over that and the comment that they made to me was, you know, that Minnesota has maybe the worst protections for our farmers in the upper Midwest. And so I kind of take that personally and I look at that um, you know, uh, the concerns that we have. And so this has been an effort of working on this legislation. We did some tweaks in uh, a couple of years ago, and this has been an ongoing uh, uh, thing. And as I look at it, and as we've had the first one in Ashby, you know, and then the next one in Carlstad, and people would say, what, what, are, we, what are you doing about it as a department? What are we doing to provide more protection for the farmers is what, uh, comes about because as you'll see most of these on average I'd say get 10 cents on the dollar from what they had held and that can be very devastating for the farmers and I understand uh, two of the impact on elevators and and a lot of our, our most of our elevators do a great job and are an important part of our economy but uh, you know I, I so I just appreciate you uh, as we look at this and how we went about uh, 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 doing the report and having the group. So I'll turn it over to Mr. Milanowski and also glad to ask or answer questions after he's done as well. Mr. Milanowski. Uh, thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Thank you, Commissioner Peterson. My name is Nick Milanowski. I'm the program manager of the Fruit, Vegetable, and Grain Program at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Part of our program is the Grain Licensing Program. Uh, I'm here to today to give you a brief overview of that program, talk about an indemnity count, and uh, also uh, just a brief summary of what our Grain Advisory Group uh, recommended following a series of meetings that we held earlier this year uh, following a request from the legislature last year. So our program is tasked with licensing grain buyers and grain storage facilities here in Minnesota. 579 of those locations exist here in this state or uh, in bordering states. Uh, we are tasked with regulating those entities, making sure that they're following the law, paying people on time, uh, maintaining the integrity of the grain that they're tasked with storing. And uh, it's a $16 billion industry based on reports that we get in uh, annually, so 2022. Um, we just got those numbers in recently. Uh, part of our law says that if you want to buy grain or store grain on behalf of others in the state, you need to hold a bond. Uh, that bond is a set amount of money based and scaled based on how much you're purchasing or storing. Uh, that's set aside and, uh, and uh, issued through a surety. Um, they also, in many cases, to get a bond, you're, getting, uh, you're having to submit financial reviews or something like that to this third-party surety. That exists outside of the state. Ultimately, the surety tells us, yes, we've bonded this company. And once the company has a bond and has paid their license fee, they get a license from our, from our program. Um, so we have $51 million of bonds on file. That exists at the entity level. An entity can be, is a company that may have multiple license locations. I think uh, we have entities that have dozens of locations around the state, uh, but they're only required to hold one bond. A big portion of our job is investigating claims against those bonds. So if someone goes unpaid or uh, for grain that they delivered to those entities, we are required to investigate those claims and then uh, uh, request that the surety pays out to those individuals that went unpaid for their grain. And so going back to 2015, we've had five closed cases on bond claims. That is outlined here. I won't go through all these numbers, but I do want to pull your attention to the very bottom of this page where it shows the total percent of claims paid. And so uh, Commissioner Peterson alluded to it, but we uh, 
in many cases sell less than 10 cents on the dollar to those, uh, those claimants in these cases. And uh, one thing I want to point out, Ashby gets a lot of attention because of the fraud that was associated with the case, but we have two other uh, elevators here in Carlson and Buckwheat Growers Association in which the, the closure and the failure to pay producers for delivered grain was uh, due in large part to a manager getting sick or, or, uh, um, or having to step away from the business and then uh, things getting out of control. And so it wasn't necessarily fraud that drove those failures. It was uh, just, you know, one thing led to another and um, that was out of the, the control of some of the managing partners of those entities. Uh, when we're looking at the total claims that we've received, and, and we do have two claims that I'm going to cover in a little bit that are still pending, we're looking at uh, $7.5 million, just shy of it, uh, of losses by producers. Um, these are losses specifically by producers, 112 producers over those years. Uh, it averages out to about $50,000 loss for each producer. $843,876, that's what we've paid out through our investigations, so that's through bonds, or in the case of Carl said Farmer's Elevator, we were able to liquidate grain and sell it and make that money available. Uh, when we're looking at the, the portion of the pie there, that's 3.6 million of rejected claims, that covers mostly voluntary extension of credit contracts. You may know those as deferred payment or delayed price contracts. Uh, they can be multiple things, but ultimately it means you defer your payment beyond 48 hours. It's still lost by a producer and a seller of grain, um, but they, they, opt, they opt into that and say, we understand that this is not covered by the grain buyer's bond and, uh, and they, have, uh, they have to sign that and we verify that through our evaluation. And then uh, there's an additional $3 million there of, of people that were expecting to get paid within 48 hours or failed to sign those contracts, that, or the, that acknowledgement, and they just went completely unpaid for their grain delivered. Moving into our open claims uh, that uh, Commissioner Peterson alluded to, pipeline foods and global processing, uh, while I can't get into the minutia of each of these um, because they're ongoing, We've received five point, roughly $5.5 million uh, in claims in pipeline foods. There's a $500,000 bond on hand for those claims, so about 9% coverage of those sales. In global processing, uh, which operates out of the same Hope facility that pipeline foods did, Hope Minnesota, uh, we expect about $1.1 million in claims and we're still receiving those today. And the bond that is on file is uh, $50,000, and that's the required bond for a new license holder. Global Processing uh, applied to be a licensed entity in Minnesota in August, I'm sorry, uh, in August 2022 and failed in, uh, in early October 2022. So a very short uh, window in which they applied. They asked for a bond from the surety, the surety issued it, and they, they went under. The, the uh, solution to protecting farmers um, that, that we have in Minnesota is the, is the bonding system, but in other states there are indemnity accounts or indemnity funds, and they differ in terms of the way that they're set up and, and how they pay out or the limitations that, they're, that are associated with them. Uh, but you can see that there's 15 other states and uh, Ontario as well in Canada that have indemnity funds. They range between $4 million and over $35 million in, uh, in Indiana. And so uh, these are all, again, set up very differently. Um, but as we've been evaluating and understanding what these protections would look like here in Minnesota, we've been talking to these other states to understand what those laws might look like and, and taking the best of what their programs have and merging them together uh, to, to create a solution that we think is best for our state. Um, the one that we, we've included in the budget, in the governor's budget this year uh, has a uh, cap of $15 million, and then if the, the fund ever fell below $9 million, then it would trigger on, and we would collect premiums on the sale of grain. Uh, that, those premiums would never exceed $2 for every $1,000 of grain sold. So uh, to put it in today's terms, if you're selling a truckload of soybeans, that's about $35 that you would pay into the 
into the uh, indemnity fund. Uh, for corn, it's about $15. Um, and so that takes me to uh, what, what are the advantages of, advantages of an indemnity fund over the current system? Well, the first is better protections for sellers. I mentioned the bonds earlier. Those are held by an entity. And so uh, they're, they're limited to just that entity. If, if you hold a $50,000 bond, that's the only amount of money that's available for the state to go in and, uh, and investigate. And uh, an indemnity fund is a much larger pot of money, and so uh, we would have that entire pot at our disposal to pay producers that went unpaid for their grain. It would also be a faster payout. The way the bonding system works currently is that when you file a claim with our office, we have to allow everyone to file a claim with us as well that went unpaid from that, from that buyer. And then go through uh, any litigation with the bankruptcy uh, proceedings, and uh, it, it's a long, protracted process, and everyone is grouped together. Well, with an indemnity fund, each claimant can be paid out individually as soon as they get their claim into the, the commissioner's office for, uh, for review. Uh, the opt-out clause is something that we've heard from other, uh, other states uh, as to being um, something that's attractive for farmers. and so. Uh, there's no obligation to participate in that you can opt out and ask for a refund for the, the premiums that you would pay. And uh, that allows anyone who doesn't want the coverage afforded to them through the indemnity fund, they could opt out and, uh, and get that money reimbursed to them. And finally, the bonds currently cost industry between $500,000 and $2.5 million annually. That's something that needs to be renewed annually through their surety or their insurance company. Uh, that would go away under the proposal in the governor's budget. Uh, that that uh, cost is currently uh, paid for by the licensed entities in, in our program. All right, I'm going to just speak to the uh, report that was required of us. Uh, last year, we were asked to pull our grain advisory group together uh, to develop rec recommendations to improve our program, as well as uh, changes to protect farmers who sell grain here in Minnesota and report back on it. Uh, so over a series of three meetings between uh, industry representatives as well as farmers and elevator managers, uh, we came with uh, three buckets essentially that these recommendations fall into. The first is the indemnity fund. I've already talked about the advantages of it, uh, what other states are doing, and what we heard from our, our members of our advisory group was that uh, the best way to structure this is not to have every sale of grain in Minnesota covered, but rather have it be a producer protection. So only, uh, only in be charged on producer sales of grain and then only protect producers that are selling grain. Uh, the second is to seek an appropriation. Uh, we heard that, the, that an appropriation will get greater buy-in uh, from the members that were supportive of the indemnity fund. And finally, to maintain that opt-out uh, clause that I mentioned earlier, that that's important to uh, allow people to at least opt out of it. The second bucket that we discussed was uh, financial reporting. Ashby Elevator failed in 2018. We pulled together our grain advisory group. We came up with a series of recommendations. That, those laws went into place in 2020, and one of those was financial reporting requirements for all license holders within, within our program. Uh, if you were purchasing over $7.5 million, you needed to have a financial audit uh, an audited financial statement submitted to our office. If you're purchasing under seven and a half million, you need to, needed to have a reviewed financial statement uh, submitted to our office. Those are expensive. Um, they're really expensive, actually. Uh, the lowest that we heard was about three thousand dollars to have those prepared, but they scale up as you purchase more and more grain. And so, what we heard from our membership here was potentially loosen those financial requirements, consider lesser reporting, such as like uh, financial comp compilations or uh, other things like um, tax basis financial uh, statements, something that allows the department to at least have insight into the financial standing of the program, but uh, maybe not come at a significantly higher cost for the, for the entities. Um, and then <coughs> currently, as the law stands, there's no metrics for measuring the, uh, the financial standing of these entities that are required to submit financial reports to us. Those financial reports are required to include six or seven items, and uh, that's it. Um, and so if, if metrics are implemented, those need to be clearly communicated and uh, as well as the consequences of not meeting those metrics. Finally, uh, the, 
the last of the recommendations fell into what we call the current bonding system. Um, and what we heard is that we should be uh, making people more aware of additional insurance. Uh, there is a private insurance out there for farmers um, where they can opt into uh, purchasing coverage for their voluntary extension of credit co contracts, their deferred payment or delayed pricing contracts. Um, that comes at about $10 for every thousand. Um, and, and so uh, that is out there and, and is not utilized uh, um, really at all around the state. Um, and also we heard that the bonds aren't serving their intended purpose. Uh, when they were put into place and these, and these uh, financial limitations for the bonding levels were set, uh, those numbers prompted the sureties to do those screenings that I mentioned earlier, looking into the financials of each entity. Well, our bonding levels have stayed consistent, but uh, the economy has grown and the cost of grain uh, has uh, increased significantly since those, those levels were set. And so the screening isn't happening nearly at the level that it once was. Uh, we've heard that from the sureties uh, um, and uh, global processing is an excellent example of uh, the the screening not happening. And, and, and one of the things I want to point out here is the requirement is to get a bond. You can shop around as an entity to get a bond anywhere. If someone denies you a, uh, a bond, you can go to the next company and they may say it'll cost you twice as much, but you can get it uh, through us. And uh, all we see at the department is that you have one. Finally, uh, the opportunity for education is out there, uh, whether it is educating farmers on how how they are currently protected, educating uh, uh, elevators on how to read these fi required financial reports and use them to their advantage, and educating farmers on how to assess when and where to sell their grain. Um, they, the group recommended that that falls not only to the MDA, but also to some of the membership uh, to help get the word out there. So with that, um, I will open it to questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Malinowski and Mr. Pe uh, Commissioner Peterson. Members, I think that uh, as we've done in the past, when we have an uh, informational hearing, we then uh, save our questions and then ask them through the lens of the bill that's before us. So if I could ask uh, Mr. Malinowski in particular, uh, not that you're not also fun to have around Commissioner Peterson, but if you could not go too far away, uh, we would appreciate that. Uh, which brings us now to um, our last order of business, which is our last bill today. Senate File 2218, Senator Kupek, Grant Indemnity Account Establishment and Appropriation, if you would, please. Senator Kupek. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First, I'd like to uh, move an author's amendment. Uh, so you'll see that here. It is the A1 amendment. Uh, it is basically, it is a delete all and uh, restart again. And uh, I'll be happy to explain why we did that if you'd like. Senator Kupek moves the A1 amendment. Senator Kupek, to your amendment. Uh, to the amendment, um, when we did the bill, uh, it came with some discussions with other people. Uh, it came to our, to, to our, it came to us that the elevator to elevator transfer uh, was not clearly defined as as being that it should not be in the bill. So any any assessments that are put into the fund uh, will become from directly from those people bringing product to the elevator. And if an elevator transfers to another elevator, we didn't want it to be double. Uh, putting a fee on that. So we eliminated that in the bill. So that is the, the by and large need for the amendment. Thank you, Senator Kupek. Uh, members, any questions or comments about the A1 amendment? Senator Western. Mr. Chair, Senator Kupek, is that the only change that's in the DE from the original language? I believe is there. Senator Kupek. And why, why a need for a DE if it's just that? Is it, there's also, I think, is there a couple of pieces of language, too, from the department, too? I think. Uh, I Mr. Laurie, if, if you would, please state Mr. your name Lurie. for the record. Yes. Uh, Stu Laurie, uh, Government Relations Director for Minnesota Farmers Union. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, not my place to do it, but I, I wonder, Council might yes. be more apt to walk through the amendment. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Painter, if you would, please walk through the amendment. Mr. Chair, members, thank you for that. Um, the, the Delete Everything Amendment has much of the same language that was in the bill, um, but it, it, it cleans up some of the, the language and um, changes a few minor things. 
Um, I'll, just, I'll just go through it section by section. Section one adds a definition of failure so that you can understand when the grain buyer has failed. Section two is exactly the same as section one in the bill, except that licensed was deleted from that section. Section three updates the reference for bond requirements and removes the word claims from that section. Section four is the same as section three was in the bill. Section five updates the statute reference for rulemaking. Section six, uh, there's some changes to the language for the grain indemnity account. Um, and then section seven is, so you on page five. Section seven is similar to uh, what was subdivisions eight to 10 in the bill. Um, I took the, the, the bill had one section with several pages of text, and I broke it into smaller sections for the statutes to make the statutes a little bit cleaner. So that's why there's more sections in the delete everything than there was in the bill. Section eight on page, starting on page six, is about the opt-out. That is similar to um, subdivision 11 in the bill. Section nine on page eight is similar to subdivision 12 in the bill. Um, section 10 also on page eight is similar to sub subdivision 13 in the bill. And then going on to section 11 on page nine, that is identical to section six in the bill. And then in the bill, the appropriation was, um, because we're creating a new account, it needs to be a transfer. And so section 12 on page 10 is a transfer rather than an appropriation. And it's a transfer to the newly created account. And then section 13 is the repealer and the sections being repealed are the same as those in the bill. And then through, mostly in um, the section that was split up into multiple sections, there were some places where the language was confusing and we cleaned it up. Thank you, Ms. Painter. Are members, any other questions about the uh, A1 amendment? All those in favor, say aye. aye, aye. Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Uh, Senator Kubek, to Senate file 2218 is amended, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, members. Uh, Senate file 2218 is to establish a grain indemnity fund in Minnesota. And we have heard here previously that after years of elevator collapses, and some of which have some devastating stories for farm families, and some of whom you will hear from in testimony, uh, this will provide, finally provide meaningful protection to producers who sell grain in Minnesota. And personally, uh, from my job in the previous lifetime uh, on the news, uh, the I do rem I remember the Karlstad elevator, which was also up in our area, but particularly the Ashby elevator was quite the news story uh, up our way, some of it for the sensationalism that was around it. And then, um, and I think also because of the Ashby elevator, even though Hope, Minnesota is not anywhere near where I live, that was also a big story. So I remember hearing these stories and hearing the stories of the farmers that were impacted uh, by these elevator collapses. And so it's, it's for me, uh, I'm very happy to be here and present the Grain Indemnity Fund as a way to, to relieve these farmers if any future failures occur. So when farmers sell grain to an elevator, uh, they often do not look to collect payment right away. In effect, uh, they are extending their credit to that elevator. What happened now seven times since 2015 is that elevators go under and they aren't able to pay those farmers. Uh, in any business that's devastating, but in farming, you work all year to market your crop and once you do, you have to pay your inputs uh, and invest in the upcoming year. Not getting paid 
uh, for a delivered grain puts farmers in an incredibly difficult position. At present, there is a system in law intended to protect producers. Uh, the state mandates that elevators purchase bonds. And as we heard before here, unfortunately, these bonds only pay out literal cents on the dollar, an average of 11 cents on the dollar across recent failures. Not only uh, is that, uh, that, that not only that, they pay years later once claims of bankruptcy are settled. So that's even longer that you'll have to wait to collect your money. According to MDA, farmers have gone bankrupt waiting for payouts from the bonds. This is a failed system. The indemnity fund proposes under my bill uh, would protect producers allowing reimbursement immediately upon confirming that a claim is eligible. And while payments would be scaled based on how long the farmers left grain at the elevator, it would offer far more than cents on the dollar afforded under our current system. Now you may ask why an indemnity fund when you could put more protections and in place and increase regulations. Uh, first of all, uh, that was tried back in 2019. The legislature tightened up regulations on grain buyers requiring more frequent audits and more requirements. Uh, Pipeline Foods and Hope had just submitted their audit before they went bankrupt, uh, leaving farmers in the lurch with unpaid bills. So at times, you can have that audit, but it's still, uh, they go bankrupt in the time that that audit has been submitted. So there's, there's some gaps there. There may be additional regulatory tools to prevent failures, and I think this committee should also consider those moving forward in the future. But there are absolutely no substitutes for the protection provided by an indemnity fund. So finally, just a couple of important details uh, on my proposal. First, uh, we are seeding this fund with $15 million, making it solvent on day one. This will also prevent any fees from being assessed on producers upon passage of the law. So that means there is no ramp up period. We are gonna provide the money uh, and if nobody makes any claims, business as usual here as we go into the future. Second, when fees would be assessed under this bill, they would be assessed on the first sale, again, producer to elevator. We've taken out that elevator to elevator part. Producers are receiving the protection and that's where the, the money should be coming from. Third, there is an opt-out provision. Producers can contact the department. They can get their money back in exchange for protection from the fund. They can also, if they decide to opt back in, we realize that some producers uh, do deal with very large elevators, uh, and if some of those elevators were to go bankrupt, we would probably be in a much uh, more dire situation than some of the smaller elevators. So there is that opt out. Uh, and fourth, there are new penalties for grain buyers who act fraudulently. So we're adding some of that uh, in as well. Uh, on the, finally, on the premium assessed on sold grain, the long-term funding mechanism for this fund, premiums will only be assessed in the years when the fund dips below $9 million, and then they would be assessed until the fund came back up to that $15 million level, and then those would go off again. They'd be capped at the absolute maximum of $20 on every $10,000 of marketed grain, uh, but in reality, they will likely be much lower. Uh, last session to build uh, the fund up to 15 million from 5 million, the department estimated they would have to assess $7 on every 10,000 uh, marketed grain. Uh, so this is pretty cheap insurance. And again, we are gonna fund it at that 15 million. So there won't be that ramp up. Uh, this is a good bill. I don't think we're really reinventing the wheel. And we can see that 14 other states, as you saw, already have this inde indemnity fund. Uh, so it's time we catch up and we protect our Minnesota producers. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'd like to turn over to some testifiers. Thank you very much, Senator Kupak. I'd like to remind our, our testifiers, also remind our members that we plan to go a little bit late today anyway because of uh, the snow last week. Uh, but we still do have an imperative to be succinct and efficient. So, uh, folks, if I could have two testifiers at a time come up. So, Mr. Phillips and Mr. Stannard, if you would both please come up to the table. Um, and again, remember, testifiers, uh, we do absolutely want to hear your story. Uh, but we would also hope that we could hear it in about two to three minutes if you could please. So, uh, Mr. Phillips, if you would please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Martin Phillips and I am here to testify for the Grain Indemnity Fund. We're a small third generation Minnesota farm south of Mankato. We're certified organic and 42 crops that we raise every year. We host a UPIC pumpkin junction event each year without charging an entrance fee 
relying on our pumpkin, vegetable, ornamental, and concession stand sales to bring low-cost entertainment to families across southern Minnesota and northern Iowa. In 2021, we had an organic corn contract with Pipeline Foods of Hope, Minnesota, to sell them our 2020 organic corn harvest that was scheduled for delivery to their facility in July of 2021. We started hauling on 6-14-2021 with the last delivery made on 6-29 of 2021. They wanted the corn as soon as possible and we kindly hauled all 16 semi-loads as quick as we could, totaling 15,093 bushels. On July 8th of 2021, we were informed that Pipeline Foods had filed a company-wide bankruptcy, Chapter 11, in Delaware on all of its creditors. We are a small farm of 420 acres with little land owned of the 420 acres. The resulting loss amounts to $112,175. We had an operating loan with Compeer Financial that we could not pay off except by using monies we had set aside for paying land rents that, of course, went unpaid. Still today, we have not recouped a single penny, and the struggle still goes on. One of the biggest eye-openers is that Pipeline Foods was only required to post a $500,000 bond. That bond was meant to help reimburse unsecured creditors in the event of a bankruptcy. The bankruptcy court has sent us a letter suggesting that we might receive 0.9 to 1.1% of our losses, and still nothing has been resolved in regards to the bond. The bankruptcy court has now demanded that the Minnesota Department of Ag send them all the information in regards to this bond and what each farmer might be owed. Their letter of intent is to make sure that no farmer or unsecured creditor will receive too much money in comparison to other farmers and others in other states that there might be a more fair settlement overall. What this has done to us is destroyed a credit rating in the mid-700s and reduced it to the mid-500s. This has wiped out many past profitable years of income and put this small farm's life in jeopardy. Life is always hard on a small farm. <coughs> and losing access to credit resources not only limits your growth potential, but also your quality of life for each member of the farm <coughs> and the children who plan on working the farm in the future. In 2022, we had two organic contracts, soybean contracts with global processing, one for $32.50 a bushel and the other for $36 a bushel. And the organic soybeans were to be delivered in January of 2023. In October of 2022, Global Processing filed a company-wide bankruptcy chapter 11 in Iowa. I have been told they only had a $50,000 bond in Minnesota. The good news is that we have not delivered the organic soybeans. The bad news is that when the bankruptcy court in Iowa releases the contracts, from global processing and we can sell wherever we can find a market, the current organic soybean prices have fallen to $22 a bushel. This represents a potential financial loss of $115,857 if the grain price stays at the current level and does not fall lower. We are advocating for an indemnity fund that will better protect the small farmers of the state. I know one of the arguments against this fund is that farmers do not need an additional fee to pay. But I put it to you that a small farm, small fee of $7 on $10,000 of grain, according to the past uh, Minnesota Farmers Union statement two weeks ago, would be a small price to pay for the farmers of this great state, and each farmer could still opt out. In closing, farmers are the very backbone of our local society, the food producers of our great nation. Lisa and I, we thank you for all your hard work concerning this issue to protect the farmers in this state. And I will remain in the chamber uh, until this uh, is over, if you have further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanard, and I'm sorry for all that, that bad luck that went your way. Um, next we have... Oops, you're Mr. Phillips, my bad, I apologize. <laughs> I still feel apologize for you. Um, next we have um, Chad Stannard, is that you? Yes. All right, you may uh, begin. Would you please say your, your full name for the record and then you may begin your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. For the record, my name is Chad Stannard. I'm here to testify regarding the Grain Indemnity Fund. I am a grain buyer that has went through grain, two grain elevators filing bankruptcy within the last five years that we've mentioned earlier today with Pipeline Foods and Global Processing. 
These farmers are my friends, and I think that they, I could say that they trust me when they are selling the grain to Chad Standard, the person. <clears throat> Pipeline Foods bankruptcy, 5.5 million of claims, just 9% of the bond coverage payout to farmers. This is a minuscule 500,000 of the 5.5 million. Global processing bankruptcy, 1 million of farmer claims, just 5% bond coverage. That is a minuscule $50,000. $50, we mentioned earlier today, 15 states have the indemnity fund. Most importantly, I mentioned Iowa, Illinois, and Wisconsin are the surrounding states to Minnesota. It is important to note that Minnesota, for the record, was the fourth largest corn producing state last year and third largest soybean producing state. The indemnity fund is the fastest payout and also the best protection. Cost is approximately only $2 for every $1,000 of coverage. As a grain buyer, I see farmers calling me and telling me that they will not haul into the state of Minnesota on the, as I am from Hope, Minnesota, which is at mile marker 32, that they will not haul to Minnesota because that Iowa has the indemnity fund. I also, with that, Minnesota's losing grain business and also losing commerce in Minnesota because of that. I end in this. One morning from southern Minnesota, a farmer called me. He told me this and I quote, I have five children. I give money to every week to church. I lost 75,000, not including the fuel, the fertilizer, the seed, etc. This was my income for the year. I don't know how I'll get through this, let alone provide for my family. I heard earlier today Mr. Spanier says we need to protect the farmland. I would add to that we also need to protect the farmer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herbs. Um, uh, Mr. Standard, excuse me. Uh, our next two testifiers, if we could please have uh, Mr. Peterson and Mr. Falk come to the table. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Herbst and Mr. Peterson. Well, please, Mr. Herbst, if you could please state your full name for the record and commence your testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. <clears throat> I'm speaking here today in support of the Grain Indemnity Fund. Uh, my name is Brian Herbst. I farm in southern Minnesota with my wife, Cynthia. I have two sons. Um, Adam is 29 and Eli is 22. Um, we've been farming. We're fourth generation farmers in southern Minnesota. Um, that's a little bit of my background as far as my family. Um, in, as we heard, uh, in July 8th, uh, we got the letter also that said uh, that there was a bankruptcy and the grain we had uh, delivered. Um, my family's operation had delivered and our liability with them is $350,000. That is a number that is um, just really hard to bounce back from. Okay, it takes years to do that, and we'll feel that for years. And, um, you know, if there's a learning moment to it, it's that my sons have the opportunity at an early age to feel it as my wife and I went through the mid-'80s. And the mid-'80s uh, were just a devastating time for family farms also with all the uh, foreclosures and things. Um, I just want to uh, touch on two things, and I think I don't need to talk anything more about the bond system and the, the failure within that system. It's uh, potentially antiquated, and you know I'm not so sure that um, it wasn't in its place years ago, because years ago, we, we sell grain in two different ways. It's a, a cash sale. And it's, as we heard, uh, it's in a form of a voluntary extension of credit. Well, a cash sale is when I haul my corn to the local elevator, and then the local elevator puts it in a grain bin, and I can walk in there in a day, and I can get a check for what I just delivered. Okay, An extension of credit 
sale is when I deliver it, and that chain has to con continue moving down. Okay, so uh, a good example is in south southern Minnesota, we have a lot of ethanol plants. Okay, so I deliver my grain to an ethanol plant. In probably five hours, that kernel of corn that was in my truck is already in a some sort of a starch vat that is taking out and, and producing ethanol. And in probably five days, that ethanol is going down the road in a tanker or on a train car going to the northwest or the, wherever it's going to go. Okay, that's the extension. So I have totally given up the opportunity for anything besides the, the hope that I'm going to get paid for that. As my understanding is, a bond does not even cover a voluntary extension of credit. Bonds are meant for the cash sale. And you may ask, why don't I take it to my elevator as a cash sale? Well, in today's climate, I can gain another 65 to 70 cents in what they call the, the basis in where I can deliver grain directly to the ethanol plant instead of sending it to an elevator and then they selling it to the ethanol plant. Last point, um, we've heard it here and, and I hope that everybody else that follows me is the same thing. It is such a high risk. That's all we do on the farm is we manage risk. And we manage that by many different ways. In, in, uh, we, we, we buy uh, crop insurance. We buy hail and wind policies. We buy um, um, all kinds of different things that we can control. And, and I've adapted the phrase, control the controllables on my farm. I can't control the weather, okay? I can't control the, the globalized markets that we play in every day. But all the things that I can control, I do something about and I try to do that. And so the impression that I want to make on this committee is the high risk that we have and the ability to be able to go and uh, control the things we can, but there are so many things that we can't. And uh, this bill here, this indemnity fund, is huge in that. It's the insurance, or rather the assurance, that farmers will have the ability to get paid for their hard work. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And once again, we, we feel your pain. Thank you. Um, next, we have Jay Peterson. Is that Hi. you there? Would you Hi. just state your name for the record, and you may begin. Thank you, uh, Ms. Mr. Chair, Mrs. Chair, and committee members. My name is Jay Peterson. I'm from Blooming Prairie, Minnesota. I'm a fourth generation farmer also. We farm 100% organic crops on our land. And I too have been financially affected by the global processing bankruptcy. All of the experts on TV and everywhere, they say to cover your inputs, all right? Lock in your profits. That's all over the place. It's overused. So I have a contract right here. It's a futures contract. This is not a cash delivery contract. It's a futures contract with a price of $36 a bushel to be delivered in January. So with that, I assumed my profits were locked in. Um, this was intended to pay for equipment to become more efficient. It was intended to pay for some debt keep that under control. So I am actually one of the lucky ones here also where I still have them in the bin, but they're worth $10, $12 a bushel less. I've added it up, it's anywhere from seventy dollars to $80,000 of profit that doesn't get taxed, doesn't go to the state for anything, it's gone. Um, I had to readjust other crops to sell, to pay for bills. And like I said, I'm still one of the lucky ones that have that crop. Um, but that still hurts, $60,000, $80,000. This is a contract with people's names on it. And it's really worthless right now. There's another sheet of paper here with nothing on it. it they're worth the same right now. 
But what I ask you to do is support an indemnity fund and put it on this piece of paper so that we have some value to this stuff and we can move forward and have some assurance, like, like Brian says, have some, something that backs us up in the state. So I am here to advocate for the realistic indemnity fund put forth before you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Peterson and Mr. Herbst for telling your stories. Um, I, and now I'd like to ask uh, Mr. Falk uh, to please come to uh, the testifier's table. Uh, and Mr. Peterson as well. We do have one testifier between uh, those two, Commissioner Peterson. Um, who will be online. So first we'll hear from Mr. Falk, then we'll go online to Mr. Worth, and then back in person to Commissioner Peterson. So, Mr. Falk, if you would, please. Chairman Putnam and uh, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to testify today in support of establishment of a green indemnity fund. Uh, I'm Jim Falk. I'm testifying with Minnesota Farmers Union today. I'm the fourth generation to operate our family farm in Swift County. I farm, with, farm the lands with my wife, Karen, and my son, Andrew. I'm also the president of Falk Seed Farm, Inc., a seed processing facility that's been in business for 38 years. Our main business is selling certified seed, but we do some food grade processing as well. So I've had a grain buyer's license for about 25 years. In 2020, MDA implemented the most recent changes to the grain buyer's law requiring more financial reporting for all grain buyers. This new mandated requirement to file a financial audit or financial re review has not been well received by the industry, and it won't solve our problem, but it will cost the industry a lot of time and money to comply. I had the privilege of serving on MDA's Grain Advisory Group in 2022 that resulted in the MDA report issued to this committee on Friday the 15th, and you saw it today. I commend the staff of MDA for their professionalism in providing great detail regarding the grain buying facility failures over the last eight years and the fact that our current statute is failing in its objective to protect Minnesota farmers. Minnesota ranks poorly as one of the worst states that provides farmers protection for grain buyer failures. MDA supports the establishment of a grain indemnity fund similar to what exists in 14 other states. Not everyone in the group was in agreement, but honestly there were no other real solutions offered that did not look like what we currently have, just with higher levels of bonding and more reporting. Let's be perfectly clear, these new requirements implemented in 2020 did not prevent the failure of pipeline foods in 2021 or global processing in 2022, which will result in millions of dollars of losses for our Minnesota farmers. <clears throat> the report was provided to both the House and Senate Ag Committees. However, I would like to highlight just a few items that are in the report. These are actual quotes or a summation or actual bullet points as listed in the report. And you've heard, you saw some of this earlier, so I'll be brief. Seven failures in eight years, over 14 million in claims against only 1.2 million in bonds. Executive summary under conclusion regarding financial reporting, it states, quote, it was evident through three meetings that the additional cost to license holders with no clear metrics or in-depth evaluation by the department is not serving the intended purpose. Bonds at current rates aren't serving the purpose they were intended to. Additional regulations won't solve issues with protections for sellers, but may increase costs to license holders. So in conclusion here, let's stop pretending that we can add another band-aid to this failed system that has been broken for years and has caused so much pain for our Minnesota farmers, who are left to fend for themselves, shocked that the government has failed them. Bonds will never be the answer as they don't cover delayed price contracts, which are used ex extensively by farmers to manage their income from year to year. The idea that more reporting will somehow fix the problem isn't logical when, in 2022, Global Processing filed bankruptcy within two months of getting their grain buyer's license. Certainly there is testimony today opposed to MDA's proposal to establish a grain indemnity fund. So you have to ask yourself why. The current system is broken. We need to fix it. Why is there opposition to a system that has, proven, has been proven in other states and would actually protect our family farmers from losing their farm or a life-changing setback or having to go to mediation uh, or worse. And farmers who don't want the protection can opt out of the program. The statute obviously exists with the intent to protect farmers when a grain buyer fails to, deliver, uh, fails to pay on delivered grain. 
Our current statute is failing to accomplish its intended purpose. Again, I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to testify today. Thank you, Mr. Falk. Our next testifier is Mr. Worth, who is online. Mr. Worth, if you would please uh, turn on your camera, uh, unmute your microphone, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Bob Worth. I farm with my son in Lincoln County in southwestern Minnesota, where we grow corn and soybeans on our family farm. I have farmed for 52 years and proud to serve as the current president of the Minnesota Soybean Growers Association, the nation's oldest soybean advocacy organization. I apologize I am not there to testify in person, but I am in Washington, D.C. this week for our National Hill visit, so I am working with our national legislators. I'm, I'm here virtually to talk about the Senate, Senate bill authorized by Senate Kubek regarding the grain indemnity funds. MSG, as part of our grassroots resolution process, supports the creation of the Grain Indemnity Fund if it is fully funded by the state of Minnesota and has criminal penalties for bad actions. We all know that there's been a lot of bad um, grain bankruptcies, elevator bankruptcies, one of them in our area, Port, that affected a lot of people. We all know that this affects farmers bad but we also know that it also affects our small communities. Because when farmers can't pay their bill, those small businesses might go under also with the farmers. So it's a, it's a double whammy. So this is very important that we get this done. In order for the new system, we feel it's fair to build this system on the back of farmers, on, on, not on the back of the farmers. We great, agree that the current system does not work because bonds are too low. As you know, the state ag budget accounts for less than 1% of the state's overall budget. Even though agriculture contributes 25% towards our state's GDP, we feel this is a small request during the state's overall Otherwise, you're asking the family farmers to carry this safety net for the companies and rural economics either by increasing fees that will face or fund uh, funding the fund itself. M MSG also has a concern with creating an indemnity fund on participation and people taking advantage of the system. Thus, we were happy to see the criminal penny penalties included in this language. I thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify uh, for this very important bill, and please give it your consideration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Worth. Uh, Commissioner Peterson, if you could, please. Can I speak for two minutes? You'd have to ask him. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Chair, we could have one more maybe testifier. Mr. We'd Chair, like to I've, I've been sitting. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. My mic on. Um, I'm also involved in this, and I came as a, a, a visitor to to listen. But I can tell the committee from my experience. So if you could, I'm sorry, before yeah, uh, I'm you sorry. would you please state your full name I'm for the sorry. record? Uh, my name is Leo Sakura, and I'm by Oatana, Minnesota. And I can tell this committee that this isn't something very new because in 2002, our family went through this with a small processor in Mendelia, Minnesota. And I contacted MDA, and I went to the court system, and I was handed a false check. And uh, so it's only going to be two minutes. but. This is not something new. So we've been farming since, uh, certified since 1998 organic. And in 2002, this happened to us. We lost our entire investment that year. If it wouldn't have been for the fact that my mother was renting me the land, we would have continued. We are now in the fifth and sixth generation of farming organically. So a bad check, I went to court, no money made, um, delayed payment. Everything happened, so thank you for your time. I'm sorry that I wasn't on your on your list. So. No, no, thank you very much for sharing your story. Okay, so we very much old, appreciate it. Old stuff. Thanks, guys. Sorry. No, thanks. Uh, Commissioner Peterson. Mr. Chairman and members, I'll be very brief. Tom Peterson, Commissioner, Department of Agriculture. And 
just appreciate the, being able to be on the record as supportive, the department is supportive of Senator Kupek's bill, and appreciate that he's brought forward this important issue, and more importantly, that we can have this discussion in the committee and address this issue. You've heard the stories, uh, uh, you know, and this is, this is the option of the department and weighing everything and working on this for many years. Uh, and, uh, you, know, we, we, you know, one thing we heard from the industry is we could uh, – work on the bonding, you know, could we, you know, we could double the fees. Well, you double the fees, uh, the current bond rates, you're still at 20%. It's still not, to me, a protection offered from the farmers. But with that being said, Mr. Chair, if this bill is being laid over, I do pledge the department's uh, uh, work as we have been to continue to work on this if there's pieces that members maybe aren't quite uh, uh, comfortable with and things that Senator Kupak would like to work on. We know this is a big issue. We know there's a lot to it, but I appreciate you hearing this, and we appreciate the opportunity to be on the record supporting. Thank you, Commissioner Peterson. We do have one last testifier, Ms. Lem Lemke. If you would please come to the desk, state your full name for the record, and commence your testimony. Uh, Chair Putnam and members of the committee, my name is Laura Lemke. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Grain and Feed Association. MGFA is a 116-year-old nonprofit voluntary membership organization which represents the interests of the state's grain elevator and feed meal industry. I'm here today to speak in opposition to Senate File 2218. In the interest of time, through both the written testimony I provided for today as well as our letter contained in MDA's Grain Advisory Group report, I have outlined MGFA's position on the creation of a grain indemnity fund and our opposition to it. MGFA is very sympathetic to producers who have experienced a loss due to grain buyer insolvencies. However, we disagree that the only way to protect producers is through the creation of an indemnity fund. Instead, we feel that through modifications to the current statutes, a reasonable increase in grain bonds, and producer education, producers can be protected, protected by preventing or at least minimizing the occurrence of future insolvencies. Senate File 2218 does nothing to address those issues. It simply creates a huge revolving account that eventually all grain sellers will be responsible for funding. I'd like to raise a few points. I was going to say something about um, it being a, um, producer funded, but being that the amendment has passed, I'll let that one go. Supporters of this bill have rejected the recent regulatory reforms and say that they haven't worked. There's hardly been time for those changes to work. After the first year of the education versus regulation by MDA, this last licensing year is when MDA held licensees to the statute and issued penalties for noncompliance. It seems short-sighted to throw in the towel and claim regulatory reforms aren't working based on one year. MGFA feels very strongly about retaining the grain bond program for grain briars and warehouses in Minnesota. We feel the independent third-party evaluation of a facility's financials helps retain the integrity of the entire industry. As mentioned previously, MGFA supports a reasonable increase to grain bond levels. In lieu of an indemnity fund, producers can currently purchase deferred payment insurance for their credit contracts at the cost of about 1% of the value of their contracts. The insurance would pay out 100% of the contracted amount and much quicker than either an indemnity fund or a grain bond within days. This insurance is purchased by the individual producer and does not require the subsidization by all grain sellers like an indemnity fund will. Finally, MDA and MGFA have fielded several complaints by smaller grain buyers who have had difficulty finding CPAs experienced with grain handling firms and the associated cost of the required increased financial reporting. Unfortunately, this bill does nothing to address those concerns, and the financial reporting requirements by grain buyers will continue. From a policy standpoint, MDA, MGFA does not support the use of compilation reports, but would definitely support an increase in the threshold level between the need for a reviewed financial statement and audited financial statements. Thank you for the opportunity to share our concerns, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, members, we've heard some uh, incredibly compelling stories today. And I think that we understand the depth, uh, significance, and complexity of this issue. In the spirit of collegiality, 
and to make sure that we remain focused on solving problems and taking care of them. Uh, we will, uh, at the end of our conversation today, uh, lay this bill over until Monday. And on Monday, we will be voting to send it out to state government uh, at that point after a brief continued discussion. But today, uh, we will talk uh, for a little while, if we can, about the merits of the bill itself. Uh, efforts to configure or shape that bill, we will reserve until Monday. Uh, and members, just so you're aware, that conversation will be brief and focused. But for now, uh, we have questions for testifiers. We have issues that we want to engage with, with the bill as currently constructed. Members, questions? Senator Westrom. Mr. Chair, uh, thank you. Um, Ms. Lemke, uh, maybe a question for you, uh, but then also the author. Um, the audit you talked about, um, how much of that are, is getting replaced with this bill? Uh, because part of the audits we uh, uh, enhanced uh, a few years ago um, have were at expense on, on the elevators. It seems like we could uh, return or get go away from some of the, those audits and requirements uh, if we're going down the road of an indemnity fund. So how many... How many, uh, how much of the, those changes uh, will help the elevators and uh, maybe to the author? Uh, what what are we doing to change uh, the audits uh, that that are an expense in the system? Uh, and if if this is going to go forward, then we wouldn't need to do all of those. Ms. Lemke, uh, Chairman and Senator Westrom, the financial audits right now. Um, they fall more heavily on these smaller facilities simply because in the past uh, compilation reports were allowed um, or they were able to do reviews. Now we have that seven and a half million dollar threshold that if you're under it, you have to do a review, but if you go over it, you're pushed into a full audit. Full audits can cost 15, 20 plus thousand dollars. And that's really difficult for those smaller facilities. Um, Yes, I guess if you, if there was a piece of legislation that removed the requirement of um, audited financials or, or reviewed financials, it would save more of these smaller facilities uh, from that expense. But with larger facilities, they're still going to be doing them. They're still going to be performing those audits. Um, usually, especially in cooperative situations, it's part of their bylaws. Um, so they're required to do that anyway. They also use it for uh, lines of credit with their banks. Senator Weston. And, and I guess, Mr. Chair, um, maybe to the author, similar question. And uh, uh, I recall Mr. Falk, who's also from my district, talking about some of the expense that came about to the smaller operators. And so maybe if he'd be willing to come and comment on it as well. Because it seems like... I, I'm not. I'm not really seeing that we're getting rid of some of those expenses if we go down this path instead. So maybe to the author, uh, am I missing that, or what? What's being considered as far as giving some relief on the cost side if 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 this is the direction we go? Senator Kubek or Mr. Falk, uh, thank you for returning to the uh, chair. Sure, and, and and also Mr. Chair, maybe if uh, if Mr. Melanowski is still here too, he is, seems to be the. Uh, Mr. Malinowski, if you would please come up to the table. Mr. Falk, if you would just uh, tell us a little bit more about your experience, if you wouldn't mind. And uh, state your full name for the record again, if you would please. Yeah, Jim Falk, uh, Swift County. Um, I, I uh, appreciate the, the question about uh, the audits and reviews. Now, my review cost me $6,000 last year and the $6,000 the year before. Um, I have no problem sending in my financials to MDA. As a matter of fact, I'm happy to do it. I've sent in compilations for many, many years. Um, well, what you have to understand with the depth of these new regulations is that it's the, the last financial statement is what they're asking for. And my financial ends on 630. Uh, my report is 12 months old before it goes on the shelf at, at MDA, and they don't have really a metric to analyze it at this point in time and or the, the, the staff or to, to go through that. So in my opinion, <clears throat> the extra reporting 
with good intentions, as I uh, said in my testimony, um, is not, is not uh, accomplishing its goal. And so consequently, if we're gonna save farmers from losing their farms or from losing thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars, uh, we can't be one or two years late on making a decision whether an elevator stays in business or not uh, based on financial reports that are already over a year old or at least they're at, everyone's is at least six months old. So uh, I don't know if that answers your question, um, Senator Westrom, is, enough, but it's a problem. Senator Weston. And, and Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. Falk, um, it, it sort of does, but if you could clarify for me the 6,000, uh, and if I heard your testimony wrong, just correct me, but that was, an, uh, that was a new expense that you had experienced based on the changes two years ago. Uh, what did you pay before that, or was that a consistent expense you've been paying for years? Uh, and and would it, it seems to me getting rid of some of that uh, expense for you if, if, if this becomes the new path we go down uh, would, would be make some sense. Uh, otherwise, we have all that expense that questionably was or wasn't doing the, the job it was intended to do, and this seems would be a different would would be trying to do the same thing. And, and we don't need to have both expenses uh, covering everything, uh, if, if that makes sense to you. Mr. Falk. Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Westrom, uh, the uh, expense of 6000 for the last two years, 6000 each year, is, uh, is a new expense item for us because we didn't have to do a, a, a CPA. Um, you know, you have to have a, a CPA accountant that's, that's uh, you know, is qualified to actually provide this type of, of, a, of a review to the state. Um, in a compilation before, that's done by a tax preparer, and, and I would say, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember up from memory here, that probably cost me $300, something like that. So it is a new expense. Um, I reached out to a number of uh, folks that do specialty business like I do. You know, I'm really not your typical commercial grain buyer. I'm a small processor. And, uh, you know, everyone is, is, is really kind of upset about the fact that they're, they're, they're required to do these uh, either audits or reviews and full well knowing that it's l not likely to help a great deal in catching something ahead of time that, that is going to prevent a failure. And I don't believe that MDA, and I shouldn't speak for them, but this is my opinion, is not in the business of shutting down facilities. And so they don't have a metric to, of which to do that. And so to continue on the same path of requiring reporting that isn't accomplishing the goal uh, does not seem like the appropriate way to solve the problem. The solving the problem is to actually establish the indemnity fund. Thank you, Mr. Falk. Senator Weston. And Mr. Chair, thank you, uh, Mr. Falk. And, and I guess, Sort of to the point I'm trying to make is, uh, in, in Senator Kupik, am I missing it? But I'm, I'm not catching it. In the, I'm not finding it in this bill in our, my quick review uh, with the DE amendment that we're really getting rid of any of that reporting. Yet we are going down a different path. Am I am I missing it offhand, or is there if, if you have a, any, a response on that? But otherwise, it seems like we, we don't need to maybe keep some of this reporting in place if, if this does in fact pass. Sure. Mr. Senator Mr. Kupik? Chair, Senator Westrom, if I could maybe turn to, to the Department of Agriculture and they could explain why Mr. that Mellon is still Elsky. necessary or not necessary. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, um, it, this language uh, as it's written today does not remove any of the reporting requirements for the financial uh, aspect of our law. Um, the, those are still intact uh, and untouched by this language. Uh, maybe I can shed some light on some of the what we've talked about leading up to this point. We had uh, this last year we required uh, all entities to file with our office these financial reports. 22% of our entities failed to file those reports with us. Um, and so we went through an enforcement process to get that, uh, get those 
entities into compliance. We're seeing a lot and hearing a lot from these entities that it's hard to find CPAs. It's also hard to shoulder that additional cost. But to answer your question, Senator Westrom, no, it is not changed by the, the language in the. Mr. Falk, you seem to want to uh, add something in. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom. Um, I think the important thing here is that we focus on the solution of protecting farmers. I think that's the reason that we're focused on this grain indemnity fund. And once we have that in place, I, I think it would be prudent to go back and review some of the things that could be changed or altered based on the fact that we have a new system in place. And so at that point in time, I think that would be the appropriate time next session, hopefully if we can pass this, or uh, shortly after to address some of those issues that you're bringing up. Senator Westrom. And, and Mr. Chair, Mr. Falk, thank you. Thank you for that suggestion. I, my, my concern is this gets adopted. It's, it's, it's nice to think we'll come back next year and fix those, but there will be another pressure point of something else more important. And so I, I do think it's probably important to tie the two together right now and let's, let's streamline it or put something in place to make that happen because my experience around here is just about 100% batting average. It won't come up very likely <laughs> if, if it's left alone. And, and then all of a sudden we've got a bad deal all around in the sense of we've got a lot of expense plus the grain indemnity program implemented, which is an expense on farmers. And maybe if that's the better way to go, let's not, let's not keep the old system in place that still costs people a lot of money on top of the new program. So I, I hear your point, though. Good point. I, I just am concerned around here. If you don't have everything kind of on the table at the same time, it's, it's easy to all of a sudden move on to other things, and, and, and then it just sits there and never gets revisited. So, and then your business and every business affected would, would still have to be paying that and, and, and never or it would be hard to get it revised. So that would be my concern, too. So I appreciate your comments, though. Members, other questions or points of discussion? I will remind you that we, were, we will have a very restricted conversation on Monday. So if you do have questions about the bill as a whole, this is the time to bring them up. Senator Western? Mr. Chair, I've got a couple others, but if there's anybody else, you can go to them first. Senator Anderson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, in regards to the letter here from the MGV, MGFA uh, regarding insurance, um, what, what amount of insurance now, are, you know, uh, the cost of insurance uh, is being required for farmers to put on their crop uh, as they bring it to their elevators? Is it, is it Sounds like what our indemnity bill, or the bill that's before us, is increasing it to ten dollars. What is what is it right now that we have, Ms. Lemke? Uh, uh, Chairman and um, Senator Anderson, right now there's no requirement for producers to buy insurance for their contracts. There is no requirement. There is an option for them if they would like to 100% cover voluntary extension of credit contracts, delayed payment or deferred payment um, contracts. It costs $10 a thousand or about 1% of the cost of, of their contract. They, if there is a loss for any reason, if for any reason an elevator does not pay that producer on that contract, all the producer has to do is send their paperwork to the underwriter and say, I'm not being paid and the underwriter is required within days to make a payment on that contract to fully pay it out. It is more expensive than the indemnity fund, absolutely. But it also guarantees 100% payment on your contracts. So, Mr. Chair. Senator Anderson. Um, with the, if, the, if the farmer were to opt in, that say, as was mentioned in several testimonies, that they would, had contracts for $36 a bushel for uh, their grain, uh, for soybeans. 
would, according to what you've just said, they would automatically, if they had insurance on that grain, that contract, they would get that $36 paid within days of, of receiving a, a statement from the, the uh, grain elevator that they couldn't pay. They would automatically get that payment, correct? Ms. Lemke? Uh, Chairman and Senator Anderson, yes. Senator Anderson? Thank you. Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Lemke, back to the contract. So if you have a contract but, not ha and, but have not delivered the grain and the, fo the, the agency went like global, went, went broke, filed bankruptcy, are you saying that without delivering the grain they would pay the contract? Chairman and Senator Ms. Lemke. Um, that is my understanding. Okay. So, uh, Senator, uh, Mr. Chair. Senator Dames. Senator Kupek, do you know, does this, uh, the, the uh, bill that you're working on now, does that include uh, payments for grain that's not been delivered, such as a contract? Mr. Malinowski. So, in this case, we had, sorry, Mr. Chair. No, but the Senator Dames continues, sorry. So, in this case, this gentleman had a, a contract for $32. He still has the grain. And so, if he sells the grain someplace else, it was talked of maybe $22. Is this bill going to make up that $10 difference? Or is this bill going to do anything on a contract where the grain has, <laughs> grain has not been delivered? Mr. Malinowski. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Dames. Uh, as it's written today, um, it, it, it would not cover that uh, additional um, loss from 22 up to thir or 36 down to 22. It would require the delivery of grain first, and then the loss that the producer incurs. That's what I assume. But I just wanted to make just have it clarified. Uh, the other thing is, there's other. You know, I mean, when we talk about insurance, there's several other options that farmers can buy insurance. I mean, they can do it. Many many companies that sell property and casualty farm insurance have an have an amendment on there that if you want to purchase it, you could purchase the coverage for that. However, it would be more costlier than what this program would be, it more in the area that Ms. Lemke talked about. But those options are out there. Thank you. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you, testifiers, for coming. It's, it's always nice to, to hear, and I know that it's really hard to come here and, and be in that chair, so I really appreciate your stories and sharing. Uh, you know, it's awful what happened to you, and, and we are all uh, are very sorry for that. And, and if you want to address that so it not, does not happen again. So thank you so much for coming. Uh, so a couple questions. Uh, we talked about the states, uh, other states. So I'm just wondering with Iowa and Wisconsin, uh, is that kind of the gold standard? Is that where we kind of made the, uh, the bill after? Or which states? And I have a couple other questions, but that's the first one. Mr. Malinowski. Thank you, Mr. Chair uh, and uh, Senator. The, we looked at uh, several other states. So the state of Minnesota is a member of the Association of Grain Regulatory Officials. Uh, we leaned on many other states that have grain regulatory programs and asked them for best practices. Uh, we also uh, heard loud and clear from our grain advisory group first meeting that they wanted us to go and ask what's working and what's not. And so we went to Indiana, Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, North Dakota, uh, I know I'm leaving another state out, but we we uh, we talked to at least six or seven states and took what we thought would fit best for the program based on what we see uh, through our regulatory actions. Senator Dornick. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So follow up with that. Uh, so how many farmers opt out um, of the program? That'd be an interesting number to see how many stay in and how many opt out. Mr. Malinowski. Mr. Chair and Senator. Uh, we spoke with Michigan, who uh, is the most recent uh, adopter of an indemnity fund. Uh, I believe they adopted the indemnity fund six years ago. They have an opt-out clause in their language, and their, uh, their farmers that opt out are in the uh, low teens currently, so a very small number. That started out higher. I believe it was in the 50s and, is, and has walked back since the implementation of the law. That's impressive. Senator Durham? 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just one more. So with this program, you have to opt out. There's no way you can opt in. Um, just is the reasoning behind that. Yeah, Mr. Malinowski. Uh, Mr. Chair and Senator, uh, we looked at other states and, and what was working and, and asked them for best practices. We also, uh, I mentioned the voluntary extension of credit contracts and requiring a signature that acknowledges that you are not covered by the bond. That is, in essence, an opt-out as well. You're opting out of the coverage under the bond. And so this is similar in, in uh, intent that a farmer would opt out and make that, that decision themselves. Senator Dornick. I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you very much for your... Senator Dames. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, going back to the other states and stuff like that and the opt-out, so let's say that I was farming and in the fall I delivered beans at the local elevator and I opted out. Now let's say that those beans are in the elevator and I have not been paid because I wanted to wait until January, February, whatever to get paid. Let's say that in December I start hearing rumors that this elevator might be in a little trouble. Then can I come in and not back in? Mr. Malinowski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Dames. Under the current language, there would be a 90-day waiting period. 90, uh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Members, for the questions, Senator Western. Mr. Chair, uh, to, to that uh, issue, um, We've, we've heard about it being voluntary uh, to, to participate in this, uh, but uh, the way I'm reading it is everybody's forced to pay it up front, and then at the end of the year, then ask for your money back. Um, that, that really kind of perverts the definition of voluntary. Um, Collect everybody's money and then, and then decide and make it a little burdensome for them to get it back. So, why why did we go the route? Is, is, am I correctly understanding this, or is it really voluntary so that people can opt out if they don't want to have the money taken out of their their grain check? Senator Kupek. Thank you, uh, Chair and Senator Westrom. So I'll start and then I'll kind of defer. But as far as first of all, just a reminder too. Uh, it's only it only kicks in if there's a claim. So we fully fund this as we propose here. Nothing nothing changes when this goes in because the, it, it is only if we if it drops below that nine million and we need to replenish it. My understanding is is that the the way we did it this way is that uh, it becomes a kind of a paperwork and logistical nightmare to try to get those people on the opt out side and that this is this is similar to other programs that the Department of Agriculture runs and so they thought it would be best to do it that way. But I will defer to the expert of this. Mr. Malinowski. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Kupak. Uh, so uh, paperwork nightmare. the way that the language is written is that uh, you can ask for a refund immediately upon payment. MDA is required to issue that, that uh, refund within 90 days of your request. Um, I, I don't have the language in front of me, but I could point you to that line there. Um, as, and, and then to double down on Senator Kupek's point, uh, for a, what we've heard is that this may be um, some, some in opposition of an indemnity fund may say, well, this is now additional accounting for an elevator or a grain buyer. Well, uh, what they would do and the way that it's written is that they would be told you have to charge a premium, a flat premium for every dollar that's sold uh, on every ounce of grain that moves across your scale from producers. And so it's a very flat accounting, easy accounting system for these entities. Um, I don't want to liken it to checkoffs, but it is uh, the accounting software uh, that many of these elevators have, have that system built in to account on a flat rate that uh, is similar to a checkoff, which would have been a flat rate per bushel or per, per dollar. So uh, it simplifies the accounting for the elevators. Senator Western. So, um, Mr. Chair, and I guess uh, Ms. Lemke, if, if you have any opinion on that, but, but it, doesn't, it, it, it doesn't make it voluntary for the farmers. It, they all have to participate and, and share their money with the indemnity fund up front, and then if they remember or they do the paperwork. So it seems like we're shifting the paperwork from the department or others to the farmer uh, under this under this 
so-called voluntary system. Um, I, I'm not buying that it's voluntary when everybody has to participate in it. But Ms. Lemke, I, I guess with the elevators, uh, uh, is that the only way the elevators could implement it? Uh, or what, what, what would stop them from just knowing up front if Farmer Joe wants to be in on it, they deduct this uh, from their check, and if Farmer Jack doesn't want to be in it, they don't deduct it, and the farmer can keep, keep their full money. Ms. Lemke? Chairman, Senator Westrom, um, the grain elevator industry would very much prefer the format that this bill is in if it were to be adopted. Um, trying to determine which producer wants to opt in and which one wants to opt out is going to create an absolute nightmare for grain elevators. Also, grain elevators aren't getting paid for this additional work. Um, if this is adopted, we have to dedicate more time, more employee time, more of our own efforts into tracking this fund and submitting the, the money to the state. Um, there's no compensation for the elevators on this. Uh, might be tangenting off a little bit, but this bill would forgive the bonds, but we're gonna spend so much more in administrative costs on this. Um, to get back to answering your question, no, we would much prefer the voluntary method where everybody pays in and at the end of the year, the producer submits a form and says, I want my money back. Ms. Lemke, if I may, just for a point of clarification, are you saying that you would prefer not to have an opt-in situation? You prefer the opt-out? I prefer the voluntary, uh, the way it's set up right now. Everybody, everybody pays in when they sell their grain, and if you want to opt out at the end of the year, send in the form. Thank you, Ms. Lemke, for that. So, Senator Western. Uh, Mr. Chair, Ms. Lemke, uh, what does an elevator do now if, uh, if a farmer has a garnishment uh, coming through the court systems or a, a loan uh, that the FSA office has uh, submitted a uh, lien against some grain that's sold? Uh, don't they have to do an individual check with individual itemizations on, on each farmer's uh, payout now, or do they not itemize those types of uh, payouts based on uh, which farmer has a lien or a judgment or something else, a garnishment? Uh, there's all kinds of reasons that there might be uh, money taken out of somebody's check. Uh, how do they handle that now? Ms. Lemke. Chairman and Senator Westrom, right now um, in those situations, the central notification system is what grain elevators have to use. They have to check that before they issue a check. And if they don't and they cut a check and give it to the producer, the elevator is actually on the line. It's considered double jeopardy. Um, we would be on the, on the line for uh, not putting a bank on a check in addition to the producer. And Senator Westrom. Mr. Uh Chair, Ms. Lemke, what about like a garnishment, uh, child support or other uh, garnishments that might come through? How, how does an elevator handle that? Is that on the, what did you call the system north? The, the, is that on that system as well? Ms. Lemke. Um, Chairman and Senator Westrom, not that I know of, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, if I could, I do have a grain elevator manager here who might be able to help. Okay. Sir, so if you could please, could you come to the desk and uh, state your, uh, your full name for the record and speak into the microphone, if you would, please. Uh, I'm Ben Bowie, the Vice President of Grain at Crystal Valley. And no, uh, right now, garnishments are not taken out of grain checks for child support and things like that. That's not, not done in, in the state of Minnesota. Thank you, sir. Sure. Senator Western. Uh, what about... I mean, is there any individual things taken out of the checks, or is it just uh, a check is written with uh, uh, hometown bank as the lien holder? Or, uh, what do you do for liens, government liens, or other other uh, yeah. payment loans, loans against grain? How how does that get handled? Yeah, Senator Westrom. Yeah, right now, all we would just issue a two-party check written in the farmer's name and the bank's name or the agency's name. And so the farmer to cash a check would have to go to that 
that bank or that agency, and then they would deduct what they owed out, you know, because they have to, because it's a two party check. Thank you, Sir Senator Westrom. So, so Mr. Chair, I guess to clearly understand, your any check you delineate to Farmer Johnson or Anderson or Olson, uh, their checks, do they get a line item of what was deducted or taken out of their checks, or or is it just a, is it the same printout for every farmer on every check that they get? And no itemization. Ms. Lemke? Sir? Um, Senator Westrom, yeah, so they would have a line item for any freight, discounts, moisture, any items like that are deducted off on a line item. That, but as far as garnishments, that's not currently done. Members, we're going to have maybe about 10 more minutes of this discussion, and then we're going to shut it down. So any other uh, questions or comments? Senator Westrom? Mr. Chair, uh, one other thing I'd like to understand just a little bit deeper is the payouts. Uh, Senator Kupik or the department, um, as it looks that there's a 75% threshold, a 50% threshold, can you walk through the, the payouts uh, for the farmers that are claiming there's not 100% uh, reimbursement as it's looking to me, uh, but can you walk through that and then there's a different thresholds based on if it's in the last 12 months or the last 36 months. Mr. Mellon, Just so we can understand that better. Sure. Uh, you want to start? I, I mean, I, my understanding, for, I will start, Mr. Chair, Senator Westrom. So my understanding is too, is that the, the, there are times when farmers want to leave their grain in an elevator, maybe just a little bit longer, get a bit slightly better price, and so that there is, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the way I might understand this, uh, is that that because the, the longer you leave that in there, maybe the more of the risk that there is, and so then the payout would go down uh, because of that. You didn't just you know, drop it off and, and have it. So, Mr. Malinowski? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, uh, Members of the committee, so uh, in the draft right now, it, it, the payment limitations start on line 13.19, but essentially uh, what it spells out is that cash sales or uh, grain delivered and signed onto a warehouse receipt would be 100% covered. Um, that is similar to how our current bonding system works right now. They are 100, they, those are covered by, under the bonding system. Then it scales back based on the length of time that the del these voluntary extension of credit contracts exist. So. Um, uh, the the first scale back is is for those that are establishing a price and just saying pay me in the in the subsequent year in the next four months or so um, that covers up to two hundred thousand dollars at a hundred percent and then up to seven hundred fifty thousand between two hundred thousand and seven hundred fifty thousand at seventy five percent and then the longer that those contracts exist they scale down so after one hundred eighty days it goes to a fifty percent coverage. And after uh, 18 months, it goes to a 25% coverage. Those are for voluntary extension of credit contracts in which the farmer has extended credit to the elevator. Those are currently, under the current system, not covered at all, and under this, covered but scaled back. Senator Western. Mr. Chair, uh, could you explain the extended credit uh, a little bit more, and then just let's, let's kind of use a hypothetical example. Uh, so you're saying uh, Farmer X brings their grain load in uh, yesterday and wants their check today, but this morning the elevator closed. Uh, what you said there, that load is covered 100%. Uh, and it, at what point does that 100% drop to a lower payment uh, if the grain was dropped off and Farmer X is still waiting for his check? And then, and then the other... Extension, you're saying those, just to try to make this quicker, those scenarios where it drops to 75, 50, and 25 percent, the grain has been dropped off, but the farmer asked for a delayed payment into the next year, maybe into two years. Uh, so if you could explain those two, those situations just a little bit more, I think it would be helpful. Mr. Malinowski. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chair, 
uh, Senator Westrom. So in your first scenario, that's considered a cash sale uh, where you're given a check for your grain and uh, it just bounces when you go to go to your bank to cash it. That would be 100% covered. Regardless of how long it takes you to file that with our office, you didn't opt into a contract that extended credit to the elevator. You didn't sign the requisite paperwork. And so you had intended to sell that grain at full price. You would be covered 100% under this bill. Um, for voluntary extension of credit contracts, as I said, you have to, both parties have to agree and come to agreement on how long that credit will be extended or what those prices will be. Um, those credit contracts are cover, a, it, it, we use that, that term, voluntary extension of credit contract, because it covers a wide variety of types of contracts. We heard about basis fixed, we've talked about delayed pricing, there's all sorts of contracts out there but what it boils down to is, I have agreed to not be paid within 48 hours of delivery of grain. And so that is where we scale this back and say, okay, we made this agreement in, in March of this year. Well, that's six months later, it's no longer covered. Or the longer it extends there and sits out um, waiting to be paid, the, the less money you can collect on that under this current proposal. So members, any final questions? Senator Weston. Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you. Um, just to clarify, on the cash, so you're saying if the cash never got paid out even after three years, that 100% cash sale would still be covered. Is that is that correct? No matter no matter when, or is what is the end date if if there is one? Mr. Uh, Mellon, one more question, Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Chair and Senator Westrom, no, there is no end date. No, no, no end date. So, so on, then on the cash. Uh, oh, I, I apologize. I apologize. Uh, line 4.4 says uh, claims filed more than 36 months from the failure are not eligible for repayment or for payment. My apologies. Okay, that 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 squares it. Okay, thank you. I was reading that earlier and thought that kind of wasn't covering everything, but I wasn't sure then. The the voluntary credit, Mr. Chair, uh, that you no, just sir. talked about. You're saying that has to be an agreement of at least 48 hours of a delayed payment from when the grain was delivered. But if for some reason the farmer hasn't collected the check for several months or even years, uh, that's when the prorated starts happening. Uh, is, is that is that it, it in a nutshell? Mr. Malinowski. Yeah. Uh, and Mr. Chair and, and Senator Westrom. Uh, the way that the language is written here is on when the contract originated. So if both parties agree to extend that payment, the payment terms beyond 48 hours, it would go to when that contract was first signed, and that's when the clock starts starts ticking for the scale back coverage under the indemnity fund. Thank you. Thank you, members. Any uh, last final questions or comments? Recall that uh, we will be, uh, again, discussing this issue briefly on Monday. We will have this conversation uh, through the lens of the two potential amendments that we might hear. Uh, I will not have any further testimony on Monday, although, Mr. Malinowski, if you're in the neighborhood. I will be skiing in Oregon. I'm sorry. <laughs> Priorities, my friend. Priorities. Yeah. Um, Senator Westrom. Uh, Maybe you want to advise him. We do have uh, Zoom capabilities. So. <laughs> <laughs> I think he will be Zooming in his own way. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, then perhaps uh, Commissioner Peterson will arrange someone else to be here uh, to help us out a little bit. But members, I do want to say, I think we had a very productive conversation today. And I think that we had a very collegial and appropriate and in-depth discussion of an incredibly important issue. And so I'm grateful to all of you for how we did that. Uh, so we will continue this conversation on Monday. Again, very focused uh, conversation on Monday. Uh, and we will also have some other bills to discuss at that point as well. Seeing no further business, oh, uh, and I will be uh, Senate file uh, 2218 as amended is laid over for possible inclusion. But as I said, we will discuss it again on Monday. Seeing no further business before the committee, the committee is adjourned. Of any action, the sale would be protected. And so, like, 